I call this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. Can I have a motion to certify closed session, please? Madam Chair, I, I certify that to the best of each member's knowledge, the Williamsburg James City County School Board, while in closed session, discussed only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements as stated in Virginia law, and that only such public matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed session were heard, discussed, or considered. I have a second, please. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Hummel. Here or aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. <laughs> Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. All right. That brings us to item 3.01, the Pledge of Allegiance. If we could please have the Matoka Elementary SEA Executive Board come up, please. Um, Elizabeth Conahay, come up to the microphone, please. Elizabeth Conahay, Conahan, sorry, Aaliyah Savage, uh, I'm sorry, Elizabeth is SCA President, Aaliyah is SCA Vice President, Emma uh, Trapilo is SCA Treasurer, um, Lila Smith is SCA Secretary, and Isabel Rudders is SCA Historian, and they are joined by Rose Burwell and Destiny Harris. Mato I'm sorry? And a lot of siblings. Hello, welcome siblings who are the SCA sponsors. You can lead us whenever you're ready. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. I particularly like your t-shirts. They're quite lovely. You're going to take a minute. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> Never. <laughs> Over my dad. <coughs> Okay. Thank you very much. Sir, will you please call the roll? Dr. Beers. Here. Ms. Hummel. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Ms. Ombi. Here. Mrs. Taylor. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Ms. Cook. Here. Ms. Ombi, can I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? Madam Chair, I move that we approve the agenda as, as written. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Agenda is approved, so that brings us to announcements and superintendent's report. Dr. Heron, please. Good evening, Madam Chair. The Tuano Middle School robotics team recently won first place for their robotics research project. Their project consisted of designing and 3D printing an innovation to, pre to prevent rags from clogging pipes and ruining machinery at the Williamsburg Water Treatment Plant. Congratulations to all the team members on this great invention. Congratulations also to Jamestown Senior Susanna Mays for winning the highest model UN award for, of best delegate at the College of William and Mary High, well, <coughs> excuse me, College of William and Mary High School Model United Nations Competition. Jamestown High School sophomore Zoe Averett and Jenny Park also received verbal re recommendations for their work in the World Tree <coughs> Organization representing Saudi Arabia. The Lafayette High School Theatre Department was recently named as champions at the Super Regional VHSL One Act competition. The One Act play, These Shining Lives, won first place among seven <coughs> other schools. Top performer and best actor at Super Regional was junior Christine Strong. Other best actors were seniors Tara Davey and Eric Stump. Lafayette High School moves on to the state competition on December 5th. This is the 11th year in a row that Lafayette High School Theatre has taken the team to the VHSL One Act State, State Meet, so congratulations. Clara Bird Baker was chosen as Best Elementary School for the fourth year in a row at Williamsburg's Occasion for the Arts. Paige Becker, a third grade artist, won Best in Show for her Oil Pastel portrait, and five honorable mentions were awarded to CBB students. Tucker Simon for a ceramic T-Rex sculpture, 
Stella Richardson for a ceramic dolphin and wave sculpture. Janiah Billups, Billups for a ceramic swan sculpture. Anya Christensen for a soft sculpture donut. And Ryan Sousa for a soft sculpture jellyfish. Congratulations to all of these students. Finally, Madam Chair, uh, a reminder that WJCC schools will host two opportunities for the review of draft redistricting maps will, that will be presented to the board later this evening. That's all of the announcements I have for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Is there any way we can get photographs <coughs> of those sculptures? <coughs> I want to see the dolphin with the waves. I'm sure we can get pictures for the board. <coughs> Are there any other announcements from any board members? Um, <coughs> I just want everyone to be sure to head out to the Williamsburg Parade on Saturday at 8 in the morning so that they can see every single one of our school's mascots and a special um, one of the parade cars floats. So anyway, just it'll be fun to see. I don't know if that's ever been done before. If we had representatives from every mascot. So it's 8 o'clock Saturday morning, Colonial Williamsburg. That actually reminds me, on December 9th, Saturday morning, is the Sentara Sleigh Bell, and that's another place that you can see all the mascots. Oh, okay. And also run five, a 5K at the same time. So. <laughs> yeah. All right, if there's nothing else, that moves us to board recognitions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tonight we have several individuals to recognize. We begin with an exceptional Jamestown student. Alexa Halco has done it again. Tonight we are honored to recognize Alexa for being named 2017 Female Track Athlete of the Year for the Paralympic Team USA. Alexa competed at the World Championships in London and won two silver medals in the women's 400 and 800 meter and a bronze in the 100 meters. The Rio 2016 silver medalist leads the rankings in the 400, 800 and 1500 and is the American record holder in all three events, plus the 200. This is Alexa's third straight nomination for the All-American list. Alexa, thank you for joining us up front to be recognized. Congratulations. <laughs> We're very proud of you. Suzanne McCory was recently named Theatre Coach of the Year at the Virginia Association of Forensic Theatre and Debate Coaches Annual Conference. <coughs> this award Excuse given me. by uh, members is bestowed upon fellow coaches who have over time empowered their students, created winning teams, and mentored fellow coaches throughout the state of Virginia in either forensics, theatre, or debate competitions. Mrs. McCory has coached both VHSL forensics teams and VHSL theater at Lafayette High School. In 2014, Suzanne was named Forensics Coach of the Year and her forensics teams have won three state titles. Uh, Suzanne, congratulations on your accomplishment. WJC's Public Relations and Engagement Department recently earned an award of merit from the Chesapeake Chapter of the National School Public Relations Association, or CHESBRA, in the category of Special Campaign. The team submitted equity through engagement branding items, which included the logo, PowerPoint template design, videos of board presentations, and the equity website. Chesborough encompasses school divisions in Virginia, Maryland, Washington, D.C., and West Virginia. Betsy Overcamp, Smith, and Ronnie Shaw have joined us at the front of the room to be recognized for this outstanding accomplishment. Well done. <laughs> Madam Chair, these are all of the recognitions this evening. We look forward to more recognitions in December. Thank you, Dr. Heron. 
That brings us to 5.02, School Spotlight, Norwich Elementary. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're pleased to present Norwich Elementary this evening, and Ms. Veronda Matthews, their very proud principal, is going to present the school this evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Heron. I am Veronda Matthews, principal of Norwich Elementary School, which in my humble opinion is among the finest of learning institutions. I, along with my assistant principal, uh, Mrs. Heather Evans, and my uh, members of my leadership team and teaching staff, am very happy to shine the spotlight on our school community tonight. As the season would have it, it is by all accounts celebration time, a time for considering the things for which we are grateful, reflecting on the wonderful opportunities we have been afforded, and showing gratitude to those around us. In tonight's spotlight, I am happy to showcase what makes us grateful to be a part of the Norwich Elementary community. With generous help from our division's director of public relations and engagement, as well as the expertise of WJCC's digital design specialist, what could have easily been a feature film has been reduced to a short video, which captures the essence of our students, staff, and community. When I consider all that I'm grateful for, leading and learning at Norwich continues to climb the ranks. Please enjoy our presentation and thank you for this opportunity. In this season of Thanksgiving, uh, there's so much to be grateful for, um, especially here at Norwich Elementary School. Our students come to Norwich with a smile on their faces every morning and they are genuinely happy to be here. The energy is felt throughout everyone from the parents that come to the volunteers to other students. Norwich truly is a fun and exciting and engaging place to learn, to make friends, to make mistakes, and to learn how to grow. When I think about that question, what I'm most grateful for here at Norwich, I would say the teachers because they're so dedicated with the students and that gives me more time to work with kids in small groups that need that extra help. I'm grateful for the smiling faces that come through that door every day. It restores my faith in mankind and makes me want to come to work and to enjoy my job. Norwich has just had this wonderful, warm and friendly atmosphere. I love the students, I love the staff, I feel like we are just one great big family. I am so grateful for the many resources that we have. Just to name a few, um, the PTA takes such great care of teachers and students and I'm also grateful for the dream box that we have. We just got this year for K and one students and within 30 days we've already seen 13% growth in our students and our community volunteer Mr. Lott he gives two full days a week just working with our students developing math literacy here at Norwich. I like it because um, well your dad can um, come and do stuff that your class does with you and it seems like so much fun since you get so much support. It's very special I think you know being able to come in and, um, and spend time with, with your child in school and as well as seeing all these, these young and energetic faces and, and uh, wonderful attitudes and uh, just the, the joy on their face when you get to give them a high five and, and interact with them. It's, uh, it's really, to me, it's, it's inspirational and it's, and it's awesome to be able to just be part of it and, and feed off the energy that these, uh, these little ones have. So as the computer resource teacher at Norwich, I am thankful for all the resources that we have here, the technology that we have, the online resources that we can use for research and other projects. Um, and I'm also really thankful for um, getting the chance to collaborate with our media specialists, our ITRT, and for this particular project that our students are working on right now with the whole fifth grade team. As the assistant principal, I am just so thankful for all of the wonderful families and students that we have here. It's just such a family environment. I think I'm most grateful for the families that go to Norwich. The families that go here, they're just awesome families that care. The kids are wonderful. The staff here also is wonderful. It allows us to do a lot of things outside the classroom, sort of like building this outdoor theater with the kids the other year that we did. 
and we're doing a butterfly garden this year and we're doing a lot of extra things and couldn't do that without such a wonderful family here at Norwich. That's what I'm most grateful for. <coughs> I am grateful to be working at Norwich because I get up every morning coming at 6 o'clock to do my part to make sure these babies have a clean learning environment because when these babies thrive, we all thrive. I am so grateful. I love doing what I do and that's why I'm grateful to be at Norwich. Would everyone who's here from Norwich please stand so we can applaud you? <laughs> Does anyone have any comments or questions for Ms. Matthews? I just thought that was a great video. Mm -hmm. I just see the, the engagement of the of the staff and the and the uh, students. That was, that was wonderful. It was wonderful. Thank you for, for doing that and, and sharing that with us. I'd, I'd like to say that one of my favorite times to walk through the halls of Norwich is in the spring. I think that's when you have Fine Arts Night or somewhere around. And, and so all the artwork, it's just, it's a magical, it's a magical school. And that's, um, it really comes alive there. And you can see all the spirit of the children and wonderful creativity. So anyway, thank you for being here and for showing this. Thanks. The next item on the agenda is 6.01 citizens' comments. And if I understand correctly, we do not have any speaker cards. Correct. There are no speaker uh -huh. cards. So with that, we will move on to the consent agenda, um, which is item 7.01, approval of the minutes from the following meetings, um, October 17, 2017. 2.02, financial report and monthly bills and payroll for October 2017. Personnel actions as presented. Review policy BBFA, board member conflict of interest and member ethics. 7.05, revised policy JO, student scholastic records. 7.06, retire policy INE assemblies. 7.07, .07, new policy IICCB-IICC, community resource persons and school volunteers. And 7.08, revised policy INB, teaching about controversial issues. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move that we um, accept the consent agenda as read. Thank you, Mrs. Young. Can I have a second, please? Second. All right. Any discussion? Moved and seconded. Sirza, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Zoneby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. <clears throat> the motion passes. The next series of items are proposed agenda items that we will um, talk about tonight, but then also will appear on our December agenda. We only have one meeting in, agenda, so, in December, rather, so um, this is our process of discussing things and, and moving them along into the next meeting before we take action. So um, the first is item 8.01, the uh, fiscal year 2019 to 2028 capital improvement plan. And um, just a reminder that we are planning to take action on this at our December meeting so that it can then be forwarded to our funding partners for their consideration. So with that, Dr. Heron, do you want to uh, have any opening remarks before yeah, thank, we... Thank you, Madam Chair. Obviously, we've had uh, some opportunity to look at this already. I uh, made my presentation on October 17th, and then the board has had one opportunity to discuss it already and this brings it back again with more information uh, for the board's further consideration. Um, so before we jump into the conversation, I just want to circle back and kind of um, divide the conversation into topics. The first is just at the last meeting, the maintenance idea, the maintenance um, items that were on. There were no there was no interest in discussing that. Everybody was satisfied with that and the, the, the data to back up the justification for the cost and the timing of that. So assuming that that is, that is true, um, we'll move on uh, to the next topic, which is elementary school. That is in included in farther out in the CIP um, in, a, in a time frame that would not make it into a five-year CIP uh, for either funding partner. But we did that, have that conversation to remind the public and ourselves and our funding partners that our elementary capacity is is at that point where we would then ask for space and so that's why um, why we've done that um, and we also talked about any opportunity to realize additional space 
uh, at the elementary level um, uh, because of the special programs that are, that are there. So does anyone have anything to add about that? Um, all right, so then I think that moves us to CIP and particularly the high schools. Does anyone want to start that conversation? Um, then I will, do you have any questions, Sandy? Um, Sorry. Well, one of my concern is last time when we, we um, met, we were talking about the cost of the additional additions mm -hmm. to the, um, for design and construction. And that's, that's a lot of money we're talking about. I'm, I'm concerned that um, instead of, Thinking, I mean, this is, comes up to 2020, uh, 2022, and we will have already spent um, almost uh, 30, well, almost 30 million dollars for that. And I would be interested in knowing how much a new high school is going to cost. I know we we talked about it, and, and at the last meeting. It was pointed out that we probably don't have enough reason to build a new high school, but I'm concerned that we're going to to do construction at Jamestown, Warhill, and Lafayette, which is going to cost uh, our taxpayers and our funding partners uh, thirty million dollars, and well, it's not quite thirty five ten. Well, twenty three million. And I'm concerned that that money could be applied towards building a new high school. So I think you bring up a good topic of the the, the idea of expansion versus building a new. Yes, school. And, and having that money put towards um, something that we are eventually going to to need. And as we know, things are not going to get cheaper in the next ten years. Uh, they're just going to become the, the cost is going to become more and more expensive. So I would like some input onto how much building a new high school would cost versus this amount of money being spent on uh, design and construction for additional capacity at our high schools. Dr. Heron, could you address that at the same time that you address the additional cost that it would, we would need to expand maker space and core space at James Tess? So because doing the additions, we realized some savings by folding those together, so we'd have to unpack that again. So if you could kind of talk about that together. Then That's could... true. If I could talk about the high school, first of all, it's very hard to give a, an actual figure because it depends on the size of the high school, number of square feet, uh, depends you know, when we would build it, whether construction costs go up and down, depending on the economy as well. Uh, it could range anything, and I'll ask Mr. Snipes to, to jump in on this as well, anything from... 70 to 100, 100 million? Yeah. Is that about right? Yeah, so in 2006 7, Warhill was 54 million. That's correct. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure if that included land. I know that was design and construction, but yeah, so the land was came from the county separately. So that's that, you have to go buy land, obviously, that makes a different number. Absolutely. And And just, so 2006 or 7 was kind of a building boom. Costs kind of came down a little bit after that, and so <coughs> I, I don't think I don't think you can put a straight 3% inflation rate from 2007 to today. But it's going to be a little bit more. I'd probably, if I was given an educated guess, I'd probably say 60 to 65 million for at least Warhill High School size high school. Do do we have? Um general consensus that as Dr. Beers was talking about during our last meeting that the community wants high schools to be below a certain population I mean is that still um, what our community wants um, versus keeping you know having three schools and adding on and having them be perhaps all a little bigger I don't, I don't know how everyone else, I don't know what, where our, as a community, our consensus is. Yeah. 
the challenge that you have, if, if we do the expansions, you're adding permanent capacity. So you're making all three of the high schools that much bigger. So when it comes time to build a fourth high school, and I think that I think we can all say that it's inevitable that we're going to build a fourth high school eventually. I don't know if that's five years from now or 50 years from now, but there's going to be a fourth high school. And so that makes that, if you if you do permanent expansion, it makes that a harder hurdle to cross as far as when you build that. Um, the, the community in the past has always thought the 1300 to 1400 is about the right size for for being able to offer you know varied programming and athletic facility athletics and that kind of thing so but do, do I, I think do we know right now if that's still where I don't know that we know that right now I've got a, uh, I, I've, I've been working <clears throat> with our projections and the actual enrollments and um, the numbers that I've come up with Right now, if you take, um, which is generally acceptable, accepted, 85% <clears throat> capacity as a uh, way of looking at, that's um, that's sort of your goal. You don't want to get too much over that if it if it's possible. If you, but if you look at 85% capacity, um, we have. Um, I, think we have I actually have the exact number. We are over four, by 453 students. I also looked at the most likely projections, and between now and uh, 2027, um, the projections are 454 students. So if you add those numbers up, you look at 900 students. And that's assuming that there's no other kind of growth, there's no other kind of changes. Um, and again, that's why I. I, I come back and, um, uh, and, and and I'm trying to adhere to um, one of the things that led to the um, uh, creation of the third high school was the um, uh, was the the notion that public or citizens wanted small high schools. They did not want large high schools. There was discussion about expansion back then. Um, and it was not supported. Um, and, and, and this, I'm not just talking about myself, I'm not just talking about a former superintendent or older people or, uh, there's another group in here too, or, or my friends. Um, I'm talking about citizens, parents in my neighborhood, uh, in your neighborhoods, um, and other neighborhoods as well, that that's one of the primary reasons they have moved to Williamsburg. The, 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 the overwhelming majority of parents that I talk to believe that we have uh, one of the finest school systems in the state. We got issues, we have problems, there are challenges, but it's one of the reasons they move here. And you notice that there's not been a huge um, um, exodus to York County. Remember? You know, maybe you weren't around here uh, back then. But that did used to be uh, a real challenge for Williamsburg. Um, it was an effort by uh, realtors to increase the population in uh, the northern county, nor northern York County, um, and we had to live with that for a while. We're, we're, we're way beyond York County now in terms of the excellence of our program, our staff, the things that we're, that, that we're going to do. And I just, um, I, I hate making it, uh, decisions like this that are really long range. We're, we'll be dealing with this long after I'm off the school board. Um, and um, but I do think that uh, when the decision was made to build the third high school, it was part of a long range uh, planning. And um, and I uh, and I think you know. And I, I guess probably the, th the, the, the the best way to find out is to. Uh, um, have um, our community members send us emails. Do you want big, do you want big high schools, or, you, or do you want small, manageable high schools like the ones? Chair, yeah. So I guess what I'm grappling with is we need um, to mitigate capacity issues today. And my sense from talking to my counterpart on the board of supervisors is. County is not prepared to build us a high school anytime in the near future. 
certainly not in the next <coughs> five years. And so I think um, a stopgap to consider um, would be expansion. And as we discussed at the last work session, I think if we followed through with the proposed expansions at the three high schools, we would still be considered small high schools around 1,500. And I don't think that level of expansion would preclude a fourth high school at some point down the road. Um, but we need to mitigate capacity issues today. Like, and it, we need to begin to address this in the next year. And I, I don't think the Board of Supervisors or the City Council is prepared to, to, or the community is prepared to build another high school in the next year or two. So we're, so we're grappling with <coughs> essentially trailers or expansion. Like, so in my mind, that's what we're grappling with today because we need to address capacity today. Um, where we were 10 years ago with War Hill is a completely different, uh, I think we're in a different environment today with regards to safety, with regards to trailers. Um, I think we, we all have seen that in our, um, in our CIP with all of the money that we've been putting towards um, shoring up the security of our entrances. Um, so I feel like trailer option is a no-go because how can we put knowing the environment that that we're in today how can we put our our children kind of in a risky situation with 15 trailers here at that high school this high school I don't know it's just it's a it's very concerning to me so. I, I agree um, you know, Columbine was many, many, many years ago. People thought that we were all safe in our, in our communities here. I think the other thing I would say about um, trailers, Rico County uses them, Chesterfield County uses them. Um, there are no um, issues up there about safety. They are um, they're watched like any other classroom. A school district so I if, if you want to heighten the anxiety of citizens I suppose you could say that sort of thing but it, it's it's still they're still part of the school they look like part of the school um, they're not that far from the school normally so um, I, I just don't um, I can't accept that argument I and, and also in light of the fact that um, we have all these wonderful um, cameras in all our schools so we can see what happens after it's happened. But nobody's watching those monitors when something may actually be happening. So I, when, you know, when you talk about security, you have to talk about all of the security. And um, I, I just don't think, um, I, I don't think that's, that, that's, uh, that's as relevant. Am I the only one well, that's I, concerned about trailers? I just no. no I agree, I agree with, with you, Ms. Hummel. Yes. As, and I think I agree with you, Ms. Hummel, about the environment is very different today. Not only are, are trailers different, and it's not um, it's it's any sort of drill that our schools prepare for, whether it be weather or, or another type. I, I think our um, the environment is different in terms of security, but it's also different um, fiscally. Ten years ago. Um, was pre, it was, it was a time when, well, the state has never supported capac uh, building infrastructure, building uh, facilities, but back then the state would, if the locality paid for the facilities, the state came in with a certain percentage um, as, as defined by the SOQ, and our local composite index in James City County has gotten progressively um, more expensive and um, this and then our unfunded mandates have gotten progressively more expensive so the load has shifted to our localities to the point where 85 percent capacity is not even in our reality at this point um, even with um, building a new middle school online we're going to be uh, uh, pretty close to that uh, on day one so I think that um, I think our fiscal reality is different. I think that this community and our funders are not prepared to build a fourth high school, much less operate one. And I think that we've got three campuses that could be more effectively utilized through 
um, expansions and we could put more kids in those schools, they still would not be big high schools. Um, they would still be well below 2,000, well below 2,000, and, and, but it would be enough kids to get us through our projections for, for 10 years. And those campuses can you know, take a few more athletes, they can take a few more musicians and, um, and <coughs> artists and, and, and absorb them quite nicely. And I think we cannot um, you know, negate the fact that we would have to add cafeteria and maker space uh, anyway, and so that would be uh, something that would not come off well, the table. Well, Kara, um, that same question was raised with the community. It's going to be expensive to build a third high school. Gee, we're th thinking maybe we don't want to deal with that. That uh, Let's leave it up to the citizens. So that's what gave rise to the referendum. The referendum was passed, I don't know if you remember. 80% people who voted, voted in favor of that third high school, knowing how much it would cost, knowing that money had to be borrowed. Um, I, I, I think it's unrealistic to say, well, we're just not going to be building a new high school in 12 years. Maybe we'll do it in 12 years. Maybe we'll do it in 10 years. I never have once, I never have once said that we have to build a high school in three or four years or five years. We don't have to. Capacity issue. Um, if you expand all of those schools, will that? I'm assuming that would accommodate the 450 that are overcrowding our schools now. What about the other 450 or 500 that are going to be here you know, um, by the end of uh, the next 10 years? Dr. Heron, could you speak to capacity in 10 years as it as it uh, our projections as it uh, relates to our the expansions and the ability to house people for 10 years? Yeah, when I uh, made the recommendation to the board for the, the capital improvement plan for this year, I didn't have final projections for enrollment. They were based on very preliminary numbers, and then the numbers I got were significantly lower. So what I presented to you was to start the capacity uh, coming, first of all, with Jamestown next year. Um, there's different ways to look at this. There's, we always, or for a number of years, have always used um, most likely projections and built based on that and, and, and looked at those numbers for building and for CIP, and we use low projections for funding and budget purposes. In reality, our enrollment has hit low projection or closer to low projection for the last four years. I'm presuming that's because of a slower economy. Things are not moving, but our reality right now is still in low projection mode. If I-64 were to open up, it would be a whole. It may be a whole different ball game, and we should use most likely projection for students coming into our area potentially. But I think if I had had the figures before I presented a, a possibility to you, I would have been more inclined to use the lower projection numbers. And, and they do give us some time so we're not actually making the decision for next year. Are the most likely um, projections, the low projections? Um, the most likely are project more students coming to us than what we've had in the last Right. Four years. Okay, We've actually mean? hit within a few students of low projection for so the last four are, years. So should we ignore the most likely? I, I think the reason we brought it forward is we have always done it that way, right. and yet our reality may not be that. And I think when we make this decision, we've got to consider every possible option and perhaps give the county and city that time to have the funding to help us to do what we need to do, whether it is additions or whether it's a new high school. Um, yeah, and, and, and it may be a slow economy why we've seen the slower growth, but it also may just be the, you know, our projections are that the growth in our, in the James City County will be in the senior population. And we are overweighted in the senior population that hasn't impacted the, you know, the K-12 population heretofore, but it might now start doing that. Um, so. I think that's also something to keep in mind. But I think before we move on to um, responding to the CIP that's in front of us, I think we need to kind of finish this conversation of are we willing to use trailers in order to wait for a, a fourth high school or do we think expansion in the nearer term is, is the better way to go? Um, 
because I think that obviously impacts what we ask. So uh, I am in, in favor of expansions. I do not think a fourth high school, I don't think the numbers justify a fourth high school in the next. I'm sorry, is this an action item? We're just doing a straw poll? What are we doing here? So Dr. Beers, this is our discussion about the right. CIP, okay. which we have to adopt so the, next month. So this isn't a binding vote, is it? <laughs> can, uh, yeah. can, can I say Mr. something? Kelly, what do you think? Okay. Um, you know, the, the current projections that we have do show low growth and, and, and uh, um, it has kind of bared out that way. I would say with the exception of War Hill High School. Right. Um, War Hill High School was 83 students over the projected this year. Um, for the past few years, they have been on an upward track. Um, and so it's kind of interesting to figure out what's going what's to go, go on at War Hill um, as, because they are still building up there. They are building for um, uh, family-related housing. They're not... They're not uh, they're not building necessarily for retirement communities, that kind of thing. Um, what I think that, and that we're kind of polluting this discussion with a discussion that we're going to have later, um, I think we need, to have, we need to have a strategic plan of what we're going to do at the high school level. Um, actually, really all levels, but, but certainly at the high school level. We have a new county manager coming in um, who may have a different flavor and, and you know, um, uh, I talked to uh, the, the Board of Supervisor member who's, who's going to be coming in for the next four years. Um, he wasn't necessarily adverse to building a new high school, but he wanted to have a plan. And I think, I think putting a plan together is, is, you know, so that we can get a, maybe even like get a task force from the community where we get some parents and we get some administration and we get some, you know, some folks to engage in a discussion of do we want smaller high schools or, you know, the 1,300 to 1,400 high school uh, um, paradigm? Do we want bigger high schools? Um, how does that work? Trailers are not necessarily a bad option if it's bridging you to a plan, to, if it's bridging you to where you're going to build a school. Um, if you look at War Hill, uh, I think we started, um, we started 13, this. 13, they had 13. <laughs> Um, third high school came on. Yeah, well, I think in 13 trailers. Yeah, well, the, um, there, was, there were trailers at Lafayette, there were trailers at Jamestown. Um, when we started thinking about building War Hill, we started, uh, the start, discussion started in earnest in 2001, and we didn't get the school built until 2007. Um, so the trailers there were a bridge, maybe that was a bridge <coughs> to the bar, and it should have been should have been closer, and we, we can all talk about the redistricting process that happened in 2007, but, um, you know, if it's part of a strategic plan, um, trailers, learning cottages, whatever the paradigm of the day where we're going to talk about those, the code word we use for trailers these days, um, I'm not necessarily averse to them. But I don't, I don't want to just put them in there and not have a plan to get somewhere. So, so for, for me, I think the whole um, expansion discussion and trying to get funding for next year to do design might be a little premature that we just we put that off. We have a... We have a we have a more of a community discussion because frankly you know the whole high the middle school thing has not snuck up on the community. We have been talking about this for years. We had to shut Blair down. We were going to build Blair. We designed Blair. We we see we see bricks and mortar happening, and then everybody knows that we're going to have to do do Blair. The high school thing has really kind of snuck up on this community a little bit. We started talking about it in May. Um, nobody really got engaged in it until you know. So we started doing the we started doing the maps and and brought a consultant on board, and I really think that we just need to slow down and have a discussion on, as a community as far as what we think is the right answer for high schools. So that's but what do you propose, Mr. Kelly, that the CIP look like next month when we vote? I've, I've for at this point, I would just slide everything out a year, and then we and we have a discussion about it in in the 2018-19 time frame. So keep. Keep the additions in as a placeholder as for a something. Placeholder and move right. everything out a year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I, I agree with him, and uh, I agree with also in um, really including the community in this discussion because uh, when I've met with co communities, they want to know why there isn't enough capacity, and uh, the fact that redistricting has brought that to their to their uh, front. I think it would be a good idea, and I agree. You know, moving it out a year, keeping this in as a placeholder, I'm I'm on board with that. But I would really like um, 
uh, a task force sounds good to me or a referendum where the, the community really has input into what happens. I also think we're, we're short-sighted. We don't have that strategic plan. Um, and and I, I'm not a person who likes to do uh, crisis management. I like to know when something is coming. And so that we can, you know, so that the community also knows that we're on top of that. So I would really like to see a, a, a written plan based on either current or it's, it's hard to do um, forecast what's going to happen in the future, but planning ahead for elementary, uh, middle, and high school so that the community has an idea that we're not going to overcrowd our schools and that students, you know, that's our number one priority. We want students to be safe. We want them to have opportunities. And uh, one of the ways you do that is you make sure that, that schools can provide that for students. And, and that means you don't have schools that are overcrowded. So that's two people who would like to move the additions, the three additions as a placeholder down a year to right. provide us the next nine months to have a conversation. I mean, Mrs. Ombi, what do you, Ms. Ombi, what do you think? So I'm not opposed to that. I guess my, my struggle is, at Mr. Kelly's point, um, we're kind of money in the waters with redistricting in, in the CIP, it's, because it is hard to, to look at them separately, because we had high school expansions in our CIP, and um, our funding partners asked us to take them out and asked us, quite frankly, to, to, um, to mitigate capacity issues with redistricting. So for me, if we push it out a year, what are we going to do to mitigate capacity now? I think we have to have that discussion then. So can we can we have that discuss can we have that discussion then and and just talk about the because this is really a financial planning document and I realize that they are connected, but at some point we have to segregate them so that we can discuss them independently. So so you're I'm not opposed to pushing it out a year. Dr. Beers? I've, um, I, I support the, the idea of pulling it out. I, and I do, I, I completely agree with the notion that um, strategic planning, long range planning, however you call it, um, we're have, we have to do that. And um, uh, so I, I if, and if that would give us uh, some time to, to uh, Get it feedback. Get you know, look at it more closely. Uh, checking out our capacity and how many empty classrooms we have, you know, over the next year, um, I think would be would be helpful. Moving it down. It's not pulling it out. Moving it down. So it's still a placeholder in the. Yeah. Ms. Hummel, what do you think? Um, yeah, I'm in agreement with that. If. It, I, I think we don't have enough data right now. Right. Um, so for me, for instance, uh, this is very helpful, the document, you know, I haven't even had a chance to look at it, but this is the document that we just received that really does an in-depth view of what our capacity is at the three high schools and is there any wiggle room, what, can, what creative things can we do. I want to know what the community feels about schools that are 1,200 students versus 1,500 students. I, I, I want to know, are they okay with that? Um, or, or you know, it, I, I would like to know that. I, I, I don't think that seven people can be making a decision about that without really feeling that the community has had uh, an opportunity to, to let us know what they're thinking. Um, and that goes for the trailers. I really would like to know how comfortable is this community with <clears throat> 16 trailers at <laughs> our high school. I, I just, I want to know that. What's the comfort level uh, of, our, of our community with that? I'm not opposed to pushing the items out either. Um, I think having more dialogue with the community is important in making these decisions. I'm not opposed to that either. So if we agree to push everything out and just keep it in the same order, push everything out, um, do we push also then elementary and middle and central office out as well, or do we hold that steady? Personally? Yes. I think we hold that steady because we, we have those needs. The, the concern I have with our elementary is that I think we need an elementary school before 2028. 
I mean, that's that's. I mean, if we're if we're being honest with ourselves, we look at our numbers today. Um, you know, that's that's over 10 years from now, and that's a long time. And uh, I don't. If if we're looking at growth at the high school level, um, that's going to happen at the elementary level as well. And I'm just you know concerned that that's that's too far out. So I, I know the our uh, funding partners might you know, are going to have to choke on a big number at some point. But um, that's just the reality of the situations from our perspective, or actually from this board member's perspective. Is I think I think 2028 is uh, way too far out for I elementary can, school. I mean, we already have a trailer at one elementary school, and we already well, and we probably should have more. And probably should have some at Stonehouse. I mean, it's I mean, that's right. that's where a lot of growth is going in the northern end of the county. Right. So so I don't know that we put it in the next five years, but I wouldn't mind seeing it in six. That hey we you know this is a, this is an emerging need and it's it's going to be there um, you know it's going to be there probably after I'm not here but I mean it, it's 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 something that we should, we owe the community and we owe our funding partners to put on their radar screen we can't let them think that we're not going to need an elementary school until 2028 because that's just not from the way I look at the numbers that's just not reality. Dr. Heron, do you feel like you have enough clarity to move forward on that piece of it? There's some other things we need to discuss, but yeah, I think I think we move high schools out uh, by one year. We keep everything else the same, and that clarifies what we're really asking for in 2019, which is the only piece that's really voted on at this point in time. Um, okay, so I think we didn't have any questions about maintenance. We've just moved the new construction out a year to allow us the opportunity to have a conversation with the community on trailers, high schools, elementary schools, and, and then also, of course, most, most importantly, our funders. But um, I, I wanted to um, just state that I'm not sure I was comfortable with the order that things were in, so we don't have to have that conversation now because we have to have this other conversation first, but I just wanted to flag that, that um, I'm not sure that expanding Jamestown first was the right order. And so um, if we find ourselves in this situation again, hopefully we can have that discussion and look at some data that might inform our thinking um, about, yeah, about. So then that Ms. Hummel holding up the dizzying spreadsheet. Um, Dr. Hart, can you, can you just so for the purpose of so citizens and the people in the room understand the difference between utilization and capacity. Mrs. Young asked last meeting to talk about usage in these schools. You know, so capacity is a fixed number. Utilization fluctuates based on a lot of varieties. It's a more, it's not a stable number to use. So can you just, just a little like utilization yeah, 101? I think especially at the secondary level it becomes a, a big distinction because capacity actual capacity of each of our schools is based on the number of core classrooms times 25 and that's where we get a capacity number that stays stable when a school is built and throughout the life of the school. But when we look at the actual usage of the classroom it depends on the programs that are being operated within a school. Special education classrooms, um, self-contained classrooms have less students and they're not a 25 to 1 ratio. If we programs like Pathways, they take up special space. So the actual utilization can be very different by school depending on the programs that are there. And so what we've provided you was a very simple walkthrough of each building to give you a sense of the utilization of each of our high schools right now. And you will notice that the Jamestown that still is, we do have a capacity issue there for next year. Uh, is being very fully used, almost every room. Um, but there might be a little bit of space in the, the yeah. other schools? Or? There is there's space in, in Lafayette High School, and that does not include the 900 building information that we provided. Okay. And there also is space at Warhill, but Warhill, as Mr. Kelly rightly pointed out, is growing more quickly. Yes. And therefore, it's space that we feel will, will fill more quickly than Lafayette High School based on the projections that we currently have. Right. And that part of the county is growing. Okay. So, um, if I, so I think we're all ready to, are we all comfortable with taking action then on the 14th on the CIP as we yeah. can? Is that nodding? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, all right, before we move on to the next agenda item, I just want to talk about the CIP a little bit because I've um, talked to several people about it. Um, and I think that it's important to remember that um, this division has been working hard on improving the CIP uh, process for a number of years. Three years ago, we commissioned and, and received the Faithful and Gould Report, the Facility Conditions Index. Is that, yeah, is that right? And so that gave us some really good data to look at how to make sure that we are maintaining our really well-maintained buildings uh, into perpetuity, that in addition to the process that Dr. Heron and Mr. Schnipes and uh, formerly Ms. Berta led to uh, poll um, the division in a more systematic way and develop criteria. So that's been a really improved, um, data-driven, thoughtful uh, process with a lot of input across the division. We also recently switched from a five-year to a ten-year plan to be more transparent with our funders because CIPs are universally five years out, but sometimes when we need, know we need space ten years from now, so we, d we did that. So the I, I hear I take your point, Mr. Kelly, about the whole concept of uh, needing high school space is new to the community, but it certainly isn't new to us or to our funders. Um, we also, in addition to adding, going to 10 years from five years to be more transparent about our needs, we switched at the county's re uh, request from a spring adoption of our CIP to a December adoption of our CIP to allow for more thoughtful planning on the funders part and allow them to build our needs into um, the budget. And I have to say that they have been really good about that. Um, and it is, um, and, and the James City County in particular, their financial management team and, and, and Mr. Hill um, has worked with this division, uh, I think, more cooperatively since we moved to December, although that did happen with a little, some bumps, but um, it's been an improvement. Um, our strategic plan that just finished and um, Mr. Murphy presented to us at our last meeting did not include operations and you know, facilities goals. I, I suspect that that will change in the future. I'm just guessing, Dr. Heron, is that, you know? They're, they're, we're in the process of yeah. starting to develop a new plan that will take us through the next five years. And, and yes, there should be efficiency and effectiveness piece that would include and then and, and I think one of the things, we did the Faithful and Gould report, which really helped us benchmark our existing facilities against others and, and grade them, if you will. But we don't, still don't have a really strong sense of benchmarking ourselves against other divisions, whether it comes to athletic facilities or educational facilities or, or, other, or other facilities. So I just say that to kind of make the point that we're not there yet. We could be more strategic and thoughtful about our planning, and we could um, uh, we could certainly improve, but we have laid a lot of groundwork in the last three years to get us there, and I don't want anyone to forget that that has happened. So, are there any other comments about the CIP before we move on? Adopting that, the next meeting. The next is 8.02, Review Policy GCBAA, Professional Staff National Board Certification Recognition. We've seen this a couple times. Dr. Heron, do you want to? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. The only reason this is back is, as Mr. Kelly suggested, taking the language off last time that put in a certain number of years because we know that's about to change. So it's the only reason it's on action as a, or next agenda as opposed to action tonight was that change of one line. So we could certainly move it to next meeting or any questions before we move this to action for next meeting? No, I would, I was, I would have been fine with it. We'll put it to the consent it agenda. Make a, it doesn't make a big deal. So that, can it go on consent next meeting? It's a work session next meeting, so action. Okay. All right, thank you. That's why. Um, so item 8.03, review policy, GCDA, conditions of employment. We've seen this one before too, I believe. Mr. Baker, I believe, is going or, to speak to this one. This is a new change as well from okay. last time. Have we not seen this one? Okay, yeah. I believe there was some change in the language to do with the... Baker. Taylor. I've seen this. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron. Uh, this uh, policy... GCDA 
conditions of employment. The last portion <coughs> of the policy deals with cost of fingerprinting, criminal background checks, and uh, <coughs> negligent checks. Uh, our <coughs> current policy, um, the applicants and the new employees pay for it themselves. So we've recommended a change for the lowest paid employees uh, of our district that uh, we will incur that cost. Uh, and that would be for employees on grade uh, one through grade seven. Some of those types of employees include bus drivers to um, uh, cafeteria monitors, cafeteria workers, custodians, bus aides, that we would incur the cost uh, for those applicants and employees going forward. This is one of the many things that maybe was a barrier to getting bus drivers on board because employees had to pay this up front themselves. And so that's where we're making a distinction between levels of employee in this policy. Yeah, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Baker, how much does it cost for a uh, fingerprinting criminal record check and abuse and a neglect check? It's total of $35. It's $25 for the fingerprints and $10 for, for child protective services. It's a $35 total oh, charge. Okay, thank you. So, so our reasoning was that for some, some, that is really a hardship for, for some people at those lower grades, they would have to work almost an entire day to, to just pay for their background check. Right. What I've seen, what I've seen is uh, they pass the drug test or whatever. They, the, the employee picks it up, but are you okay with it? I'm okay with it, but it's just it's just sure. other things and. Still Any other questions? Okay, so this will go on our agenda for adoption at the next meeting. Okay. The next item is 8.04 appointment to 21st Century and Career Ready um, Advisory Committee. Just an application. Does, do you want to talk about this, Dr. Heron, or? Doesn't have the red marks. Okay. All right. So this will transfer to action at the next meeting. Unless anyone has any questions. Come. Eight point zero five purchase of elementary school laptops, Dr. Heron. So this is uh, our <coughs> annual elementary oh, refresh for <coughs> laptops at the elementary school level. Mr. Landers is here to take us through the agenda <coughs> this evening. Thank you, Mr. Landers. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron. Uh, we are asking your consideration for approval of purchasing elementary teacher use laptops as part of our ongoing refresh program. Uh, the timing of this purchase was to allow the assignment of the laptops with Windows 10 uh, to the elementary teachers in the early spring. Uh, that'll give them time to become familiar with Windows 10, the new interface, before we upgrade the elementary student laptops, which would occur next summer. Uh, it also provides for a special year in pricing consideration from Lenovo. The purchases request is to provide 500 teacher laptops for a total purchase price of $359,500. Excuse me, $500. The funds are allocated within the technology budget, and we will make use of a state VITA contract to look at. Any questions? Yeah, I have a, because uh, I've always wondered this myself. Um, the, um, this is the purchase. Yes, sir. Uh, can you tell me the difference cost-wise if we lease those, knowing that um, the life of a laptop, um, if you're lucky, if it's used a lot, it's three years, three, you know, three to four years. So I'm just curious um, if we lease them instead of buying them. We have looked at the lease model a number of times, most recently this past spring in the February, March time frame. And really there is no cost benefit to leasing. Basically they take the cost of the device, they divide it by three, divide it by four, pass that cost directly to us. And we actually lose some flexibility if we lose it, move into okay. a lease model that we currently benefit from. So, um, and do you, um, my assumption also is when you purchase these, um, you also purchase the three-year warranty with those, or, or how, to, how does that? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. We purchase a matching warranty to provide for the life of the device. All right. Any other questions for Mr. Landers? 
Thank you, Mr. Thank Landers. You. On the agenda. Uh, Great. So that brings us to action items. 9.01 Title IV Federal Program Grants Application. May I have a motion, please? Chair, I approve the Title IV Federal Program Grants Application for the 2017-2018 school year. Thank you for that motion, Ms. Hummel. Is there a second? I second that motion. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Any discussion? Second that motion. No, that motion. <laughs> Any discussion? Thank you. Very Hearing much. none. <laughs> Thursday, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Motion passes. Brings us to 9.02, purchase of James Blair Middle School Technology Infrastructure Items. Can I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move approve, approval of purchase request for technology infrastructure items to support James Blair Middle School construction to Optech in the amount of $346,949. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Can I have a second, please? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Young. Any discussion? Hearing none, Sir, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Motion passes. Item 9.03, contract award for the security camera system upgrade. Can I have a motion, please? I move that we award the contract for the security camera system upgrade to Office Pro Technologies in the amount of $120,000, $120,311 and 25 cents. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Can I have a second? Second. Well, any discussion questions? Is that another way of saying Optech? It's the same, it's the same company, right? Okay. Yeah, I still, I'm, I'm looking at the background here. It says, uh, this is my same question that came up last month, and, and, and I mean our last meeting. It says, the School Division Safety and Security Committee is charged with continuous monitoring of the division security equipment practice and procedure. Okay, I'm on board for that. I still am worried about continuous monitoring, but that's probably to be held at another time, a discussion about that. But, okay. Just want to make my point. I made it. Duly made. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions or comments? None. Ms. Thurza, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. The motion passes. That brings us to 9.04, revised policy BFC policy adoption. May I have a motion, please? I move that we revise policy BFC policy adoption. Second. Second. Thank you. Discussion or comments? Okay, hearing none. Ms. Sirza, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Thank you. <clears throat> motion passes. That brings us to item 10.01. Um, WJCC 2017-2018 Equity Series uh, 2. Liter colon literacy. <laughs> Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. This evening we're pleased to, to bring to you some information about literacy. Literacy is one of the, the key ways in which we break down barriers for students. And tonight, Dr. Moore is going to give us a, a really good overview of the literacy instruction that we're providing for all students uh, to meet their needs. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school board, and Dr. Heron. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to present as a part of this second season of the Equity Through Engagement series on behalf of the Office of Curriculum and Instruction. This evening, I am honored to present you with an overview of our WJCC Elementary Literacy Program and the work that we are doing to close achievement gaps for our lowest achieving students. This presentation will provide an outline of the key literacy practices that we use to provide all students with what they need in order to be successful. Our literacy program is designed to provide a solid foundation to all learners. In previous equity presentations, we have seen highlights of the specific interventions that we provide to specific groups of students. Our WJCC literacy program is designed to provide our lowest achieving students, regardless of their subject, subgroup distinction, with the best possible first-time instruction. 
We do this so that the more specific interventions that they receive from other programs can be layered on top of a strong initial foundation. At the end of this presentation, I will present a few data points that highlight the movement our division is making towards closing achievement gaps for specific groups of students. The key literacy practices that I will now outline allow us to meet the needs of every learner. Our literacy program <coughs> is not a basal reading program, nor is it a product that comes from a package. We use a balanced approach to literacy, which means that we don't prescribe to one single method of literacy instruction. Instead, we integrate several modalities of instruction so that we can give the right amounts of support to help students become independent readers, writers, and thinkers. Inside our classrooms, teachers are providing clear and direct skill instruction using authentic texts that can be found in a library or bookstore. We integrate reading and writing instruction so that students are not only writing about what they read, but they also learn how to turn their reading skills into writing strategies. Our teachers also reinforce literacy skills in small group settings. This allows them to address the varying learning needs that are found in today's classrooms. Small group instruction is one of the hallmarks of our instructional method and is the key to closing achievement gaps. We do not deliver a one-size-fits-all instructional program. We tailor our instruction to meet the needs of our students. Our journey began in 2014 with a renewed focus on our WGS <coughs> literacy philosophy and professional development on direct skill instruction using authentic texts. Teacher teams began to meet during their common planning times to discuss the learning outcomes of their lessons. With support from their school-based literacy teams, teachers also identified teaching resources that would best support the learning outcomes. In 2015, our professional development efforts concentrated on small group instruction. We emphasized the ways that small groups can provide differentiated instruction to students. Differentiation is the cornerstone for meeting the learning needs of all students. Through differentiation in small group instruction, teachers are able to use materials with varying readability levels so that students have access to the right reading levels. They use appropriately leveled texts to practice the skills that they are learning. Teachers can also adjust and provide additional levels of instructional support to students during small groups. This creates a learning environment where all learners can move towards their goals for independent reading and writing. In 2016, we continued our concentration on small group instruction and placed a greater emphasis on using informal assessments to pinpoint exactly where teaching should begin. Using assessments to guide instruction further strengthens the supportive nature of small group instruction. And this year, we added a focus on writing instruction. The VDOE is in the process of revising the K-12 English standards, and we use this as our opportunity to stay ahead of the curve and provide a revised writing curriculum that emphasizes the integration of reading and writing. This year, we also completed a major overhaul of our elementary writing assessment plan. This change de-emphasizes the focus of writing to a prompt and instead encourages authentic writing opportunities <coughs> that can be embedded into the curriculum throughout the year. Let's take a peek into a few classrooms to see <coughs> this literacy focus in action. We find that with modeling with real text, it gives them the same impression of when they are in their just right book reading. We get a much more organic, real, authentic way that children are able to then take it and put it into their own book that they're reading. The connection with readers and writers is a huge part of what we do here because good readers are also good writers. If we're, if we're doing all of our strategies that we need to for reading, we can also apply to the same strategies as for writing. We can't function without small group instruction here at James River. Um, our children are reading on a vast spectrum of levels. So it is super important to have small group instruction daily because you need to meet the needs of your children and where they are reading. If you don't, you will not have success in moving children forward and getting them to become readers as learners. There's no way.
In 2015, we decided to make our literacy instructional philosophy more tangible and created an elementary literacy program guide. The program guide serves as a resource for teachers and explains the nuts and bolts of how to teach children using a balanced literacy approach. This program guide serves as the foundation for every decision we make about literacy instruction. One of the major changes that the Elementary Literacy Program Guide has allowed us to make is with the way that we deliver professional development to teachers. The research is clear. One of the highest effects on student achievement is the instructional capacity of our teachers. We have some of the best teachers in WJCC, and they bring a wide range of expertise with them to their classrooms every day. Because of the Literacy Program Guide, schools have been able to request specific professional development topics that suit the perspectives of their staff and students. The Literacy Program Guide ensures that all professional development is aligned under the same instructional philosophy regardless of topic. The Literacy Program Guide also allows WJCC to maintain consistency in professional development content while allowing individual schools to modify the learning formats to fit the adult learning styles and needs. Just as teaching with a one-size-fits-all mentality is no longer an accepted practice, providing professional development with that same one-size-fits-all manner is no longer the only option. The Reggie Routman Reading and Writing Connections Professional Development at Laurel Lane Elementary is just one example of how a school has used the Literacy Program Guide to choose a specific, sustained professional development focus. This video highlights the work that they are doing and is just one example of the many extraordinary professional development opportunities that are taking place in our elementary schools. This Sustained PD initiative has been fantastic. Um, this is my 11th year teaching, um, and this is the first year that I've had or been part of a Sustained PD initiative. Uh, what I really like about it is that uh, I know what to expect when I'm going to these professional developments, um, and it's really nice to have the different PDs build on each other, and it helps to put together the experience of those who have been in the classroom for a while and those who are new to the profession who may have some ideas coming fresh out of school that we are not privy to. If nothing else, it creates a shared dialogue amongst colleagues um, within the school buildings and especially when there's a professional development that happens amongst the district. It just builds upon itself, which is really helpful when it comes to planning and executing these things in your classroom because I think sometimes when it's a one and done PD, it gets practiced once and then it gets let go. But having to cycle back and revisit this over and over again, um, I think is really valuable. With the Read You Route and Reading and PD that we've been doing, it's made a big difference for my students. I mean, even as early as yesterday, when I was connecting the nonfiction text features that we were learning about reading to the informational writing we were getting ready to do. You know, you kind of saw that light go off with some of them. So that's a really wonderful thing for them to be able to make those connections and understand the big picture. At the classroom level, we monitor the progress of individual student learning through numerous division-wide reading assessments, such as the Developmental Reading Assessment, or DRA2, the Phonological Awareness and Literacy Screener, also known as the PALS Assessment, and the Measure of Academic Progress, or MAPS Assessment. Ultimately, the impact of our literacy program is judged by student performance on the English SOL tests. I have a few charts that highlight the gains that we have made in closing the achievement gaps between specific groups of students since we began our division-wide emphasis on literacy in 2014. The next four slides are all formatted in the same manner and show gap trends for specific demographic groups of students. I will take a moment to emphasize that our WJCC literacy program does not provide support to any one demographic group. Rather, our <coughs> literacy program is designed to support the learning of all students, including our lowest achieving students, regardless of their demographic classification. 
The large chart at the top of the slide indicates the division-wide gap trend based on results from all English SOL tests in the given time frame. This includes the elementary, middle, and end of course English SOL tests and provides an overall picture of the work that we are doing as an entire division. In the school year before we began our elementary emphasis on literacy, there was an overall gap of 30 percentage points for our African American subgroup. The gap was reduced to 23 percentage points, which is an 8 percent point reduction after accounting for rounding of decimal points. Underneath the overall trend chart, you'll also see the individual tables <coughs> of SOL pass rates of students in each elementary grade level. The smaller group sizes of the individual grade levels allow for wider variability from year to year. However, the data from each of the elementary grade levels is showing movement in the right direction towards closing the achievement gaps. These data on our economically disadvantaged group do not show a large reduction in the gap, but the movement is still going in the right direction. We have moved from a 26% gap in 2013 to a 23% gap in the overall division data last spring. The gap analysis of our students with disabilities group presents the area for most opportunity. We are working even more closely with our partners in the Department of Special Education to identify the areas of our literacy model that can be strengthened to increase support for our students with disabilities. This year, there has been a greater emphasis on removing barriers that might prevent our special education teachers from attending grade level planning meetings. We are also taking a closer look at how we can encourage the transfer of learning to the general education classroom from the Wilson, Language Live, and Passport Reading Interventions. Our largest gains in closing the literacy achievement gap for a specific group of students has been with our English language learners. I must express a cautionary reminder that when we drill down to the individual grade level data <coughs> for some of our groups, the small number of students can cause wide variability from year to year in the pass rates of that particular group. When the number of students is a gr in the group is smaller, each individual student can have a greater impact on the pass rate for the entire group. In this case, even though the grade level data changes drastically, drastically from year to year, the overall division-wide trend of reducing the achievement gap is noteworthy. In closing, this graphic is not only a great visual of how we in WJCC use a balanced literacy approach to provide our lowest achieving students with a strong foundation of high quality literacy content and instruction. The graphic also exemplifies the work we have done as a division to align our efforts and work together using a solid literacy philosophy. The positive movement that we are making towards reducing achievement gaps cannot only be attributed to one individual factor, but rather rests on the shoulders of every educator and program who has the opportunity to support student learning. Thank you for your time this evening, and I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Dr. Moore? Mrs. Young? Yes, can you go back to the slide that was the students with disabilities? Yeah. Okay, it says a gap increase. Yes, ma'am. Okay, the bottom line is the students with disabilities. Doesn't that show a decrease there? No, ma'am. Say that again. The lines are getting farther apart from left to right. So, so on the right side, it's 87 and 46. Right, I see so that. 85 and 49, so that number is closer enough. But it is increasing. Okay. Basically, we still have work to do in, in all of these areas and especially with our students with disabilities. Right, and I, I know that that's a difficult area, but Mr. Thorpe to explain this to me later. <laughs> I'm picking on him. I want him to explain it to me. <laughs> Don't be. Madam Chair, I just want to applaud um, you for your, the division for their efforts and certainly appreciate the transparency and, and while there's definitely an opportunity for growth, particularly in this subgroup, um, I think overall we're making strides. And so I look forward to, to more outside of the box thinking and creativity and, and 
finding ways to, to help all of our students achieve and to mitigate those impacts. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Kelly? So, so these graphs are the same groups of students as they track through the system? So it would be from, so, so what group of students are we looking at here? So in this particular graph, we are looking at the students who were in grades three, four, and five at the elementary level, six, seven, and eight at the middle school level, and the end of course at high school in 2013-14, and then the group of students that were in those particular grade levels in 2016-17. So this is not cohort data. We're not looking at the exact same group as they move through the school years. We're looking at the data from that particular grade level for that particular testing year. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, the other thing, too, the video, I was, <coughs> the one thing that was struck me about the video um, is that you had a, had a teacher talking about her professional development and said that they're being exposed from the younger teachers being exposed to newer ideas. And I thought that was really very, very important uh, concept that, uh, you know, just because you have more experience doesn't mean you have other, don't have something to learn from the newer teachers. And I thought that was, uh, that was a real good point. So, appreciated that. Dr. Beers? Yeah, Dr. Moore, I've, I've also uh, applaud <coughs> what you and the, the division has done. The gaps are getting smaller. Um, and they get hard, you know, the smaller they get, the harder they they, they, they get to um, remove, but um, the, to me, this is very impressive. And um, clearly, the district um, has uh, has adopted a really balanced, sensible approach to uh, to literacy development and, and also uh, instruction. I just a question I have. It's probably and it, it may be more in the area of special ed, but I'm curious. Um, when, uh, how long has the Wilson program been used in, in Williamsburg with special ed kids? I don't want to misspeak. Miss Bourgeois, I think we'll probably be able to, I, to take I that one. I always thought that, that, that was kind of a, uh, a pretty, pretty standard um, instrument, uh, instructional uh, program for special ed kids. Three years ago, we did a training so that we could have uh, at least one teacher at every elementary and middle school that was trained. Um, last year was the first year that they could work with more than one student because the Wilson training is very intensive, and you go to the training, and then you spend year one year working with one student and being observed before you're fully certified. So last year was actually our first year with full implementation. So... Um, or, or is, or, or, are you hoping that over time um, the number of students who are worked with will increase, you know, as we get more teachers trained in that area or, or can work with, the, with two students? The Wilson program is designed for a very specific um, set of needs for students. So we do have some criteria that is used to appropriately identify students right. for that program. Uh, we have looked at possibly increasing it. We have not determined that feasibility at this time. Dr. Bears, I think it'll come down to staffing and budget and looking at the impact of the program and whether it's really having a good effect on our students. The, the, the what's really what's so critical about that, especially with with, um, with kids with, uh, with disabilities, learning disabilities particularly, is that one on one is it, it's absolutely. It, I mean, to me, it's money in the bank. When 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 you have a student who is having you know really severe problems in literacy, um, that's a uh, that's major. That's and I know. I know it costs money, but it, but it's like pay now, or we're going to end up paying later. So I I I commend that. Well, all of you as well. <clears throat> Ms. Hummel, this is just thanks for all you do. Um, I just think the reading specialists, it's magic what you can accomplish uh, for our children, and in an amazingly short amount of time, when, especially the English is uh, the ESL student. It's just really impressive to me. Um, what is authentic writing? When you, when you kept, maybe that's just a new term for me, but if you could just in layman's <coughs> terms. 
Absolutely. So <laughs> traditional writing might be writing to a prompt or where a teacher assigns a topic. And authentic writing would be for more, more purposes that you would see in the real world. Um, at the younger elementary levels, we try to, to really instill that love of being an author. And so we use a lot of text and, and mentor text from authors to, to build that feeling in students, and then as students get older, you might see more things like um, responding uh, about a book, a recommendation in a blog format, or something that you would see more in the real world, rather than just a, a worksheet or uh, a prompt. Is it like journaling? Or? It could be journaling. That would be one part of it, absolutely. Or creating text, creating booklets, creating um, things that, that a student would feel that they could put that on a bookshelf in a library or in a bookstore. Okay, can, I, can I make one, one comment about that? Just a, <laughs> sort of, a little. as I used to tell my uh, students, a grocery list is very much authentic writing as well. You would have been a fascinating reading specialist. <laughs> 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 Dr. Moore, thank you very much. Um, I, I, we appreciate your work, and I'd like to echo um, Ms. Zonby's co uh, uh, comment about transparency. Um, obviously, there's some work to be done, but we appreciate knowing about the successes and also the opportunities. And as I tour elementary schools, it's 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 wonderful to see this in action, and um, and we just saw it in action the other day at Clara Bird. So um, it's, it's neat to see that what you think you're doing, you're doing. It's happening on the ground. So anyway, thank you. Anything else before we? Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Moore. you. All right, that brings us to 10.02 James Blair Middle School Progress Update. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're pleased this evening to bring you a progress update on James Blair Middle School, and Mr. Snipe is going to introduce our special guests this evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron. In March of 2016, the board awarded the construction management services to McDonald, Bollard, and Peck with MBP. One of the scopes of that uh, RFP was for them to present to the board uh, updates of the James Blair Middle School. And tonight we have representatives from MBP here to do just that. In addition, we also have the principal of James Blair Middle School, Mr. Ty Harris, who will also be providing an update um, on, on things that he has been working on. So I wanted to invite Ty up um, and MBP up, but MBP first to provide their update. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Snipes. Madam Chair, Dr. Heron, members of the board, uh, thank you for having us here this evening. My name is Jim Yatsik with MVP, and as uh, Mr. Snipes mentioned, um, our firm was hired to uh, help oversee the construction of James Blair Middle School. And uh, I'm joined by Eric Caldma. Eric is our very uh, capable on-site construction manager. And uh, Eric is, is the person who is responsible for making sure that the contractors are doing what they're supposed to be doing on a, on a daily basis. So I'm going to give a little bit of a, a brief overview of the project. And um, uh, following that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric. And he's going to walk you through a little bit of the uh, most recent uh, progress uh, with construction out there. So uh, just uh, some uh, brief information about the project, 109,000 square feet on the existing James Blair Middle School uh, project. Um, if you recall, uh, the early part of the project involved demolition of um, part of the old building to make room for the new building. Uh, so that was accomplished in an earlier phase and, and construction on the, the new uh, James Blair is currently underway. Um, just uh, information about the building. It's pretty pretty typical construction project, um, typical construction for a school project. Uh, structural steel frame, uh, masonry at uh, areas like the gymnasium, um, some of the, the back of house type areas. Uh, interior side, it has um, some drywall partitions and um, masonry partitions, as well as uh, some high end type finishes, very durable finishes like terrazzo. So, be very uh, aesthetically pleasing school when uh, all is said and done. Uh, we, we do have some renderings to, to show uh, later on in the presentation that Eric will go over. Um, site work, uh, there uh, will be minimal improvements on the site. Uh, they're going to be redoing the ball field that is currently out there. 
um, new parking lot, new bus loop. Uh, the city of Williamsburg is actually doing the uh, road work um, to expand uh, Long Hill for turn lanes into the school. So we've been coordinating with the city uh, to make sure that those projects uh, meet up successfully. Uh, some other unique uh, features of the project. Um, flexibility really is the key. The, the way that this school was designed, uh, it's going to offer a great deal of flexibility with the way that um, classrooms could be opened up. Even the lockers um, in the core areas of the, the, the class areas can, can be moved to open space up for various um, school activities. So the, the, the principal and staff is going to have a lot of uh, flexibility with the, the type of programming and education that could take place inside the facility. Uh, a few other features. Um, one I think is pretty neat is a uh, concept um, they, called wall talkers, but it's basically a very large um, marker board, kind of a floor to ceiling type concept um, that will be on the walls where um, various activities and instruction can take place. And um, then your, your typical uh, multimedia, I think, um, that is still, still being worked out with uh, the um, school's uh, IT staff. Um, and then uh, just last uh, feature to mention is that there's a shared stage in between the um, gymnasium cafeteria. So again, that will allow uh, flexibility for some of the um, type of activities that are taking place in those areas. Uh, just briefly on the budget, um, the, the phase uh, 1B, which is what we're in now, is um, the, the general construction phase 1A is what we, we termed for the demolition portion. Uh, the phase 1B uh, general construction contract was um, just under $22 million. Uh, change orders to date is $48,000, a little over $48,000. So on a percentage basis, if you take that as a percentage of the uh, construction contract, it, it only comes out to about 0.22%, uh, percent, which is, is very favorable. Um, our goal is always zero change orders, of course, but there are changes that take place. Sometimes they're programmatic things where, um, where the, 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 um, you want to make changes to the program um, while uh, construction is taking place. So that, that accounts for some of the changes. There's also been some um, unforeseen condition type issues. But uh, overall, we're, we're very pleased with where the, the project is from a, a change order standpoint. So in good shape with the budget. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric. And he's going to talk a little bit more about um, progress to date. Jim, and uh, thanks for having us this, this evening. Um, I'm going to kind of review kind of what's uh, taken place over the past year and a half. <clears throat> so here was an uh, existing aerial photo. Uh, the, the left half is the, actually the central office, and the right half was the part that was uh, demolished to make room for the new school. All right, uh, part of the renovations uh, of the uh, phase um, 1A was uh, a new entrance into the central office, and it was re actually relocated to the other, other end of the building. We also have um, a new reception area, as well as a new uh, mechanical room, all the equipment in there to, to operate the buildings. All right, and he here's a uh, rendering of the, the final product. Um, you have the central office on the left side, and then the right side is the new school building. Uh, here's a, the typical first floor plan. Uh, the bottom right is actually uh, unit A. It's a three-story portion. Admin area on the first floor and the second and third floors uh, are some classroom space as well as the resource uh, center. And um, the top right portion is your classroom hub. And that's also three levels. So there's one level for each grade level. Top left is the food service area in the brown. Green is the auditoria with the stage moving uh, across to the gym and then the locker rooms. And then the, the, the bottom left portion in the brown is the um, fine arts. Uh, here's an aerial photograph from December of 2016. Right side, you can kind of see the outline of the, the raised portion of the building. And then above the, the central office, you can see where some of the foundation work is, is starting for the new school. A uh, month later in January, uh, you can see a sing significant amount of the foundation work is, is underway, and it's actually uh, uh, pretty good opportunities to see the shape of the building. A few months later, so we're in uh, mid-spring here, 
Um, you can see uh, some slab on grade has been poured. Uh, that portion, and that's towards the top right, is the gymnasium, the music area, and the locker rooms. Down towards the bottom of the slide, you can see where the classroom portion uh, have walls up to the second floor already. Early summer, you can see there's a significant height to the, to the building. We actually have the decking over top of the gymnasium. And if you look kind of the bottom left, you can see uh, the area was cleared and uh, rough graded for the, the new parking lot. Uh, the end of summer, um, we've got the, the second floor deck in the classroom uh, area. Uh, they've got the decking on the, the gymnasium, and then you can see at the bottom of the slide how the um, parent drop-off and the parking facility is uh, taking shape. Here was uh, September. We have the roof on the, the gymnasium, and that's uh, important <coughs> to allow for uh, storage and staging of some of the uh, more uh, weather-sensitive materials. If you look towards the top of the slide, you can see we're already doing some grading around the ball field. And then again, towards the bottom of the slide, you can see we've got some uh, curb and gutter going in around the parking, parking lot. November, um, decking, the roof decking for the classroom portion is, is in place. And you can actually kind of make out a little bit of the equipment curbs up there. And under the blue tarp is the material for the, the uh, classroom roof. And uh, you can see there's a little bit of work um, between Cooley Field and the school, uh, a little bit of work on the, the bus loop. Um, here's uh, uh, some of the architectures, uh, uh, architect's renderings of, of the finished product, as well as some uh, progress photos. Um, this is the, the classroom portion. And in, in the photograph, I'm standing in one of the classrooms looking through the collaboration space to the other side where the classrooms are with the windows. This view is um, standing where the gathering stairs are, kind of where the main entrance is into the school, looking through the auditoria to the, uh, up onto the stage, and then through the opening, the dark opening is actually the gymnasium. And this, uh, the point of view for this uh, photograph is actually standing on the stage, looking through the auditoria towards the, the front entrance and um, the gathering stairs as well, just by the lift. This is the structure you can see for the roof. A couple of elevation uh, photographs. This is the north end of the classroom area. Um, the yellow is actually a spray, uh, spray applied polyurethane foam, uh, meant as a, the thermal barrier. And uh, in the large opening is where there's a, a three story curtain wall window system that, that will be installed. Here's a photograph of the uh, student entrance coming off of the bus loop. See some of the brickwork over to the left on uh, the uh, classroom. And uh, a very important uh, part at this, at this point is the uh, building envelope. Um, and it's important so that if, uh, once we get the windows in, the brickwork up, and the, and the roof on, we can start conditioning the space so we can actually start installing the interior finishes. Uh, some key milestones uh, notice to proceed was in October of 2016. Um, they've gone through uh, through the, the winter, spring, and summer, putting up the main structure of the building, which includes structural steel and uh, structural masonry. Um, another key component is the uh, start of the roofing system, and we're well underway. And uh, the interior stud walls actually started yesterday, so we're, we're looking. Uh, another um, major milestone will be in February uh, with the startup of the ventilation system for the building. 18, we have substantial completion. Um, any questions? Questions for Mr. Yatsik or Mr. Coleman? Mechanical room that was the new central office, is, is that just for central office, or does that impact the new James Square? Uh, no, it's, it's just for the central office itself, yeah. And what some of the components were actually relocated, like the cooling tower was, was salvaged and, and moved into place. 
And then some of the stuff that was in the, the photograph, the pumps and the piping, that was all new that was married into the existing system in the school. Okay. Yeah, it is two totally separate. Um, the uh, the change order percentage, I think, is amazing. Obviously, a good uh, indication of the level of uh, management and also uh, working with our contractor to get that. Working with the contractor as well as the design, a thorough design definitely helps. Right. Um, I hope that I hope our. So, are we on schedule, ahead of schedule, behind schedule? We're we're on schedule. Um, as you can see, like we, we were starting the interior stud work uh, um, a few days early, as well as uh, we're well underway with the roofing system. So um, once we get uh, um, the roof and the, the rest of the envelope uh, together, then we can start conditioning the space and weather kind of comes out of play. Yeah, and to, it helps you to get more resources working on the inside. Yeah, so uh, by the end of the year, we should be able to, to start with the interior finishes. So uh, nice job with the schedule, nice job with the budget. I hope our safety, our safety numbers are, are equally as good. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you very much, both of you. I also want to um, make notice that Mr. Riley, Hugh Riley from Oyster Point Construction, is also here tonight. Um, he's our, he is our contractor on site. So. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron. I'm here to provide a brief update on um, some of the things of note at James Blair, the staffing, purchasing, and the unveiling of our mascot and school colors. <clears throat> Earlier this month, the WJCC Human Resources Department sent a memo that went to all WJCC staff um, informing them of the internal staffing procedure Application submissions and interviews for internal transfers will be held in stages with the first stage starting in mid-December. We hope to complete the entire hiring process by the end of April. The building itself is coming, is coming along nicely. We have begun the furniture and equipment procurement process. Recently, a couple of teachers and I visited the old donation school in Virginia Beach to get some ideas on transformational furniture. I've been working with content specialists to ensure that we open with necessary equipment such as music in instruments and PE equipment. And now to the mascot and school color unveiling. Um, we conducted two surveys. One was administered to WJCC students currently in fifth, sixth, and seventh grade. A separate survey was uh, for everyone else, students in other grades, staff members of WJCC, and the uh, <coughs> greater community. We had over, almost 3,000 votes cast, and our colors were chosen based on the appeal and availability. And <laughs> to uh, announce that the spiders <laughs> could let it go. I feel about that, Mr. Harris. <laughs> um, <That's laughs> I will say, over the past few months, I've had an opportunity <laughs> to meet a number of um, <laughs> community members that have attended James Blair. I've also met a lot of people that taught at James Blair. And, and they really had strong feelings and spoke very passionately <laughs> about their experience and their joy of being a spider. They, they really did. And so um, we're excited. Our colors will be maroon, silver, and white. Uh, we have not finalized the logo yet, but we will be um, hopefully unveiling that in the spring, early spring. When will the spirit wear be available? <laughs> <laughs> as soon as possible, just for you. And, and we want we want a really friendly looking spider for the mascot <laughs> parade next year. I think Dr. Carroll has some good ideas on what the mascot should look like. <laughs> so. Are you are you done, Mr. Harris? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Mr. Yeah, yes, Mr. Kelly. First of all, I'd like to welcome you to WJCC. I think it is so um, great for us. Um, the staffing, I was, I'm interested in um, how the staffing is going to, uh, going to be put together. Um, in the past, I mean, we, <coughs> obviously we have great teachers, but there is a bell curve for those teachers, and I've, I've been concerned in the past that we have kind of quit, put together a quote-unquote all-star team. When we open up a new school, that the principal you know, hire all the best teachers, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I just want to kind of feel how, we're, how that's going to, 
how we're putting that together. I'm not sure if you can answer that tonight, but we we can't answer it specifically tonight. But I know with Dr. Carroll's influence, having been through the process internally before, we've got a lot of heads working together to make the process very fair to all schools. Okay, um, and for those for those uh, teachers, obviously there's going to have to be some professional development based upon. You know, the design of this building, the open space, and, and that kind of thing. Can you, can you speak to how what kind of what that kind of looks like? Quite honestly, the the programming that we plan to offer at Blair is not unlike any of the other middle schools. Um, you know, we we are very lucky to have excellent schools in the division, and so we envision Blair's as being you know one more. Right. Great school. Now, having said that, along with the, to your point, with the hubs and the collaboration space, uh, there will be a learning curve as far as how best to you know, utilize those spaces uh, specifically. And, and there, we will have uh, opportunities to, to help teachers through that. Um, but as far as the program itself, it, it will be the same as, as right. what currently exists. Right. If I could just add to that, the program will, will be similar, but some of the approach will be a little bit different. I know Dr. Carroll is working. Uh, closely with Mr. Harris in the professional development of teachers. Dr. Carroll, do you want to mention a little bit about where we're going with that? Sure. Uh, we've uh, currently starting, um, because Blair, we're going to have a focus on project-based learning, but for our experiences with, uh, <laughs> at the high school level, the last uh, two years, we believe that as an instructional methodology, project-based learning is something that all our students should have the opportunity to experience and to increase engagement in their classroom. So uh, we're currently, uh, starting in December, we have a uh, uh, partnership with William & Mary, uh, Deeper Learning Fellowship, that we have uh, approximately 30 middle school teachers who have uh, volunteered and been accepted into this uh, program that's going to be uh, both face-to-face -face professional development and blended learning over the next uh, six to seven months. Um, and no promises that those teachers uh, will be assigned to Blair, but they're all going to be leaders uh, at all the middle schools as we help to uh, further and expand this idea of project-based learning to all four middle schools next year. But also to your point, you know, <coughs> how that project-based learning eventually looks at Blair. There are going to be some unique opportunities due to the building and the, and the construction there uh, that may not be up, you know, at the other three, but you know, there'll be different opportunities depending on space and, and configurations at, at all four of the middle schools. Uh, okay, and then new, another topic. Uh, as you develop Mrs. Hummel's friendly spider mascot, um, <laughs> is you going to do the same process that you did at Blayton or or, or do you know how that's going to happen yet? Uh, I know we're, we're working with our PR department on how that's going to, to get designed. Thank you. I'm really glad that you're doing the project-based learning across all four middle schools. I, I thank you for that because that to me is really important that we're not, we're not just having something happen at one school and then other three not having the opportunity to take advantage of it. So I appreciate that. Thanks. Anything else for Mr. Harris? I, I kind of like the Wild Wild West spider, but I thought that worked in great with robotics. <laughs> you know, I was thinking of something, and I know it's not very friendly. <laughs> but I just, I'm thinking, you know, web of inclusion. There's all sorts of things you can oh, do. Oh, that's cool. I, 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 <laughs> there's a lot you can do. I hope you enjoy being a spider. I, 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 you knew that that was going to be the choice, right? I mean, you knew that going in, right? I, I won't go into the personal... <laughs> Your struggle? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, We've had lots of conversations the last couple months. Yeah. I just want to know what kind of spider we're dealing with here. <laughs> oh. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Best of luck to you as you move forward. Okay. That brings us to uh, 10.03, uh, presentation of draft middle school redistricting maps. So we're going to stick to m middle school. Um, before we begin, I'd like to, before I toss it to Dr. Heron, I'd like to thank the communications folks for sending out really good messaging on uh, and, and engaging the community. So thank you very much. I thought that was 
um, good work, and I hope that the community uh, engages online and at the meetings coming up. Then I'd also like to talk about process. So we have the meeting, the public meeting, on the 30th of November, and then on, on December 5th. And then we've got um, our December meeting he, that we'll discuss it um, uh, at our December, and then two January meetings. What can you remind us what our deadline is for adoption of maps or a map? We really need to adopt maps uh, by mid February. Okay, so the first meeting in February. Because students are starting to select their courses for next year. We're developing schedules and we need to have that information to move forward. So at the latest, the first meeting in February. So it's so from this just for the public's information, this board could discuss the maps. Um, at the December meeting two, and two January meetings for a final vote in the, at the February meeting. Yes, ma'am. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's my pleasure to welcome Scott Leopold uh, from Cooperative Strategies back this evening uh, to again remind us of the process that we're going through and to present some uh, potential maps for the redistricting of middle school and then of high school. Thank you. Great. Uh, it's great to be here again. I just wanted to you know, talk a little bit about the process, kind of start off to refresh. We really started out uh, months ago talking about our measurable criteria, uh, what our considerations want to be, what, what our framework was as we develop options. I'm going to review those today. Uh, we'll talk about the analysis and, and the process that we went through to develop the options. Um, and we'll talk about you know, the, you know, the options that we developed. We have, uh, I believe, three um, middle school options, and we'll have really six high school options to talk about tonight. Um, moving forward, this is really the beginning of the transparency and the engagement process. Um, I urge you to um, just kind of sit here and absorb tonight. We really don't want to talk too much or discuss or debate any of these options yet. This is really the first uh, unveiling of this, and we're going to be collecting feedback over the coming weeks uh, so that we can adjust, make changes uh, based on that feedback. And so. We'll have that discussion once we have the options and the feedback <coughs> together so that we can have a more fruitful conversation about it. Here's our, uh, just our overall timeline. We started in uh, August, and as we just alluded to, here we are. This is the, where the rubber hits the road with the community engagement. Uh, we did start with our, our, our measurable criteria. Um, we, where we landed was utilization, and so balancing enrollment between the schools. Uh, proximity, and so we want to minimize the need for student transportation. What we looked at is, is we wanted to get students to their first or second closest schools as much as we could. And longevity, which also is kind of related to utilization, kind of where we thought of that is, is when we talked earlier about that growth that we see in the Warhill uh, in, in that area. We want to make sure that if we have the opportunity to maybe leave so that the utilization low in some of those schools to allow for future growth and not have to come back here and make changes reactively later. Uh, the other two additional criteria that we did consider was socioeconomic status, uh, balancing that among all schools, and then the neighborhood concept. We wanted to keep neighborhoods together as much as we could. <clears throat> so uh, what we have here, this is our current, uh, our current boundary scenario and where we have our, our utilization. Uh, we're showing our Great advanced utilization for next year. Uh, we know we have our, our overutilization issues at Berkeley, um, Hornsby, and Tawano because we're bringing that new middle school online. At high school, we have uh, Jamestown overutilized. We do have some room at Lafayette. Uh, War Hills got a little bit of room, but again, we have that growth area up there, and so we may not want to adjust that boundary uh, as much as we do the others. Looking at our balance of, of uh, socioeconomic status, uh, you know, we've got an, some imbalances that we'd like to try to remedy in, in both the middle schools and the high schools. This is the process that we went through to develop these options. Uh, we built a, a pretty comprehensive tool uh, in Microsoft Excel using some extensions for uh, ArcGIS mapping. And so what we were able to do in a work session set, setting is basically cut up the, the division into about 50 or 60 little pieces. And we can assign those pieces to any school and we can instantly see what is the impact on utilization um, what is the impact on the uh, socioeconomic balance? And so that allowed us to, to develop internally you know, probably 15 or 20 different options that we we weeded through and we boiled down to the, uh, the different options that you're going to see today that are most representative and most viable. So 
Thursday and next, next week, we'll be presenting these options to the community uh, for large-scale feedback. Uh, we're going to start with a presentation much like this where we talk about the process. <coughs> uh, we'll probably throw a couple more slides in there to talk about the student density and those kinds of things like we had in our earlier meetings, just to kind of give everybody the full picture. Um, we'll have the opportunity for community members to fill out an individual questionnaire and uh, share their feedback about the options. Uh, what we're asking for is, you know, Give us your level of support for each option. You can love all of them or you can hate all of them. Uh, and then tell us what your preferred option is. Uh, and what we do want is we want productive feedback. We don't want um, somebody coming up and screaming at us. Uh, we want something written down that we can actually take and report. And so um, we're not going to have an open mic at these meetings. It's going to be written uh, documentation that we'll be collecting. And then all, that, all of that feedback will be put into a report and we can analyze it and see what particular segments of the community may think and we can use that to adjust these options. Um, I can't remember, uh, you know, in the last 10 years, the last time that we just took an option through the community engagement process and then didn't tweak it based on feedback from the community. And so this is not a, this is not a, a rubber stamp process where we're just, you know, we've got a pre, you know, preconceived notions. This is really an open, transparent process where we do want that feedback from the community. Everything that we have is going to be posted online, I believe, later tonight. Uh, we actually have the surveys up. Uh, we've got the middle school survey and the high school survey now. Uh, we'll have a recording of this presentation available tomorrow. We have all the maps available online as well. And we also have a online mapping tool where you can just type in your address and it'll tell you what the school would be in each option for both middle schools and high schools. So uh, all the information that we have throughout this process is, is available online for everybody to see. So again, uh, when we come back in, in December and October, we'll be looking at that, those results in a report format and then uh, any changes that we may make to the recommendation based on that. So digging into the middle school options. So here's our... our Can I stop you just for a second? Sure. For the, on, for the, um, for the um, online survey, is there a deadline for that? Uh, I'm sorry? Is there a deadline for that? Is I think we're a... leaving it up until December 12th. Okay, thank you. So here's the, uh, the current middle school boundaries. And so all these maps are going to be uh, the same color scheme. So we've got Tawano in the green, uh, Hornsby is in the pink, Berkeley is in the purple, and then in the option maps you'll see Blair and blue. Uh, you can see our current and projected utilization and current and projected socioeconomic balance uh, for each school. And so we're at 112% at Berkeley. And this is based on where the students reside, and so it may not exactly match the actual enrollment totals, you know, because there may be special programs here or there, but they're going to be in the ballpark. Um, and what this, what this is, is, as far as grade advancement goes, is we're just taking the students that are already in the system and we're just rolling them forward one year. And so this 110% or 112% is 870 students that currently live in Berkeley that are in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. The 902 is the 5th, 6th, and 7th in the same geographical area. And so it's not going to line up 100% with the future think projections, but those are based <coughs> on the current boundaries. And so this is the best data that we have, and this is, this is good for, uh, will suffice for planning purposes. Um, one thing that I did want to just, just kind of point out here is that we did have some conversation earlier on about um, underreporting of socioeconomic status at lower grade levels. And so you can kind of see here, if we're looking at the current 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, those socioeconomic numbers are a little um, higher when we have the 5th grade in and the 8th grade out. And so we're kind of showing that, that, is, that that's a, 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 a true observation. And those are percentages of students on free and reduced lunch? Is that what that is? That is correct. Okay. So um, just looking at our, our first, just our baseline here, again, we have our utilization, which is imbalanced. We've got 5.3% of our students that do not attend their first or second closest school currently. Um, and again, we've got our utilization. If everything stays the same, the, you know, the, we're, we're going to go up at Berkeley. Hornsby, Hornsby's going to be about the same. Tawano, 106 to 101%. I mean, again, this is just great advancing. It does not have that growth that we would have in the future think projections. <laughs> Uh, but we also do show, again, we have that socioeconomic imbalance. We're 53% uh, low SES at Berkeley. We're 22% at Hornsby and 34% at Tawano. If we're looking at next year, our overall average is going to be 36%. And so that's what we're trying to get 
all three of those schools to is that average. And so that's our, that's our starting point as we come into these options for middle schools. <laughs> So here's our first option. Um, in these maps here, we've got one slide that's going to show and, and highlight the areas that are changing. Um, the cross-hatched area is going to uh, denote the area that would be moving and the color would match that school. So this red cross-hatch uh, would, would denote an area moving from Tawano to Hornsby. And a blue cross-hatch is going to be moving from, any, you know, from, from anywhere into Blair. And so in this first scenario, we have some areas right here, just on the southern edge of, of Tawano, moving south into Hornsby. We've got some areas uh, here, right kind of in town, moving from Tawano into Hornsby as well. And then we have this large swath here that would be the new established boundary for Blair, along with this area right here, which is Merrimack Trail and some other areas. And so this is our first option, and you can see we've got our current utilization over here. Berkeley, currently 112, it would be at 86%. Blair would open at 85%. Hornsby would open at 80, or it would, would be at 80, and then Tawana would be at 83%. So we've got some pretty good balance there. Um, you know, we're a little, you know, we, we've got room for growth there in Tawana and Hornsby. We're loading up Blair and Berkeley. If we look at our socioeconomic balance, Berkeley would go from 51 down to 47. Blair would open at 39. Hornsby would go from 20 up to 29%. Tawano would stay about the same at 30. And so every, every one of those schools kind, kind of gets closer to that average, maybe not as, as much as they do in some other scenarios. Uh, it does do a very good job of balancing utilization. Um, an additional, about 16% of students would not go to their first or second closest school. And I thought about this, and it seems like it's a scary number, but the reason for this is because of our close proximity that we have between Berkeley and Blair. And so, kind of Ford's Colony in here, their first or second closest school is going to be um, Hornsby or um, Berkeley. But we've got to get kids to go into Blair from somewhere. <laughs> and so, looking at this, looking at these, uh, these, these closest school, the, those proximity numbers, I don't think it's really fair to compare them to the current baseline just because we're opening up a new school and, and the schools are where they are. But it, it's absolutely fair to compare those to each other as we're look, looking at these options. Our, our socioeconomic range is going to be from 29% to 47. Again, everything's kind of getting closer to that average. Uh, we don't split um, any, you know, we don't have any additional neighborhood splits. Um, you know, just looking at the big ones here, um, Powhatan Secondary stays together, Ford's Colony stays together. Um, we, don't, we don't have any splits that, that we've created that didn't already exist at the elementary or maybe at the, at the high school level. Uh, we also show our students impacted here just to, just to kind of illustrate how many students we would be going from school to school. Uh, the reason we want to see this is we just want to see are we moving large cohorts of kids that we're not singling out smaller groups. Again, this wasn't a criteria, but it's something that will come up in conversation with community members, and so that's why we have it on this, on this data. So our next slide just shows our current boundaries side by side with these proposed boundaries so that you can just kind of compare and contrast and see the differences. So moving on to option two. So this one uh, is a little different. We don't have quite the same shape here in uh, as large a boundary for Blair. And we have the, you know, the Merrimack Trail area here um, would stay at Berkeley. And then we have the area south here, which would, would be a, you know, another detached island zone for Blair. And so looking at this from a proximity standpoint, um, whether, they, whether they get off the bus and they go to Berkeley or they go to Blair, it's their first or second closest school. Uh, it's a detached zone, but what it really did is it kind of helped us balance our socioeconomics a little bit better than we had in, in option one. And so we've got, we've got Berkeley going from 51 to 43. Blair would open again at 39. Hornsby goes from 20 to 32%. And Tawano goes from 31 down to 28 um, With the exception of, of that, you know, that little change at Tawano, everybody's kind of moving towards that 
that center a little bit better. Our, our overall balance is good. We're 84% at Berkeley, 83% um, at Blair, 86% at Hornsby, which is our, our largest school. Uh, Toano is 79, room for growth. And again, our overall average, once we have Blair online, is, 80, is 83%. Um, it does a really good job of balancing our utilization. Um, our additional, our, our kind of proximity number is a little lower. It's 13% instead of about 15% on the option before. So, so economic range is a little tighter, 28 to 43. And again, we don't have any neighborhood splits in this, in this scenario. Here's our side-by-side -side comparison. And so the main differences between one and two are, are, are basically these areas right here. We've got, and I lovingly call it the shark fin, but this is that Merrimack Trail area, area here. And then we have uh, the grove down here. And those are the differences between <coughs> one and two. So moving on to option three. So what this option is, is this is, uh, this is more of an attempt to uh, not have all that much impact. Uh, and so you can see the majority of the changes are going to be in that crosshatch blue area, which are just moves uh, into Blair. We do have a little area up here that would move from Tawano into Hornsby. And we have some areas down here that would move from Berkeley into Hornsby. Um, our utilization, 83% uh, at Berkeley, 79 at Blair, 84% uh, at, at uh, Hornsby, 85 at Tawano. <coughs> Berkeley goes from 51 to 52 percent uh, in SCS. It's up one percent. Looking at Blair, it would open at 43 percent. Hornsby would go from 20 to 23 percent. Tawano would go from 31 to 32 percent. But you've so, got numbers that aren't that consistent in that single slide. I'm sorry, which one? The socioeconomic status by school ranges from 28. To 43%. Oh, I'll get that one fixed. I apologize. Okay, so which one's right? Table's right. Okay. So it's 23 to 52%. 23 to 52. Okay, thank you. So uh, this has an additional 19% uh, of the 20% of students would not be attending their closest school in this particular one. Again, that's going to be related to that, just that pro close proximity <laughs> between Berkeley and Blair. And again, we don't split any, any uh, neighborhoods in this scenario either. So here's our side-by-side -side comparison of this one. And that's it for middle schools. Do we, ha do we have any questions on the, on the presentation or the, clar the clarity of the data? Yeah, bef yeah before we go move on, um, uh, is this going to be posted online, this presentation? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and then also, um, one more thing about the, the, the deadline. If people um, want to reach out to us, I want to encourage them to do so. They can text us, they can call us, they can email us directly. If they want to be anonymous, they can do the survey. But if they want to, you know, so please, any fashion is, is something that we all welcome. So I just want to be really, supermarket, you know, Christmas or you know, holiday shopping rather, you know, just whatever. We're 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 here to listen. Um, so Scott suggested that we, because we have three meetings to discuss this particular map, so for middle middle school uh, only, um, he suggested that we just take this in, and um, and so I I'd like to propose that we just take this in and then wait for some citizen comment and then come back and discuss January. I mean December. Our two meetings in January. February. Yeah, just one comment. Oh, the maps have better clarity than what yeah. I see. Yeah. So on the on the on the website we have big. So at our community meetings we're gonna have big plots that have detailed roads on them for people to see, and those are also available on the website. And we're just limited by 1080 by 1920 pixels on this presentation, and so yeah, they must have it in the half sheets. Yeah, right? absolutely. That's, that's and that's that's also why we have the 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 school finder app on the website so you can just type in your address and, and find out exactly what the impact is. Can I ask if you could correct this? Absolutely. Before it gets posted? I'm going to, as soon as I'm done, I'm going to fix it. And for, oh, got it. Right Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then also just not, uh, <coughs> in terms of moving forward in, in information for our next meeting, 
the little criteria alignment box is very helpful. Mm -hmm. But when you presented to us early on, you kind of presented a grid where it was kind of alignment ranking. And so I, that information is, I think, very important to the board. So, you know, you have, you've got utilization in the grid. Um, longevity, it would be good to get your sense of how, how well you think these each score on longevity. Mm -hmm. um, and then proximity, maybe which percentage are going to their first, second, and third closest sure. school. Or fourth, in, in some, maybe in some cases. Um, and socioeconomic status, I think, um, maybe rank by the delta, maybe. Um, sure. And then also uh, the neighborhood concept. So it says no additional neighborhoods, but are no neighborhoods are split in any no. of these, correct? Okay. So that would be those kind of the information is here, but having yeah, that. Yeah, just a comparison table or something. Yeah, that would be very helpful. Okay. Does anyone else need any more information before we look at this? Dr. Heron. Uh, I think if the board has suggestions, comments, uh, questions that they want to ask. Obviously, Mr. Leopold's mm -hmm. here to take those questions from you is once you have a chance to study what you're seeing tonight. Um, as we get community input, obviously your input in the process is really important as well. If we have questions after we've had a chance to absorb this, we can then convey those to you and you Abs can get them. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Being able to absorb the information probably would be helpful. So that brings us then, if there's nothing more on, on middle school, <coughs> excuse me, that brings us to, to high school. So thank you. Okay. So here's our, our current high school boundaries. So we have Warhill in the purple, um, Lafayette in that, that kind of seafoam color, and then we've got our Jamestown in the, the yellow or mustard color. Uh, we know we've got our overutilization at Jamestown. Um, Kind of our underutilization at Lafayette and Warhill is you know is, is close to close to 100 percent I mean again our, our overall average is very high we're, we're 95 or 96 percent looking at that data um, our socioeconomic deltas here uh, currently we're we're 20 percent low SES at, at Jamestown we're 39 percent at Lafayette um, so we've got our we've got a little bit of imbalance in utilization as far as uh, proximity, we're pretty good right now. Only half a percent of students don't go to their first or second closest school. And I, I sat here and looked at this puzzled. And <laughs> it's pretty easy when there's only three schools to not go to your first or second closest school. And so that was kind of where that, where that number came out. Um, what we have here is we actually have two different sets of tables. Because as we were developing um, our options, uh, we really weren't kind of sure where the CIP was going, and so we kind of accounted for a scenario where we have our current capacity, and then we accounted for a scenario uh, with our increased capacity at both um, Lafayette and, or I'm sorry, at Warhill and, and Jamestown. And so what you'll see is, you know, if we, if we had those additions and they, we had them next year, we'd be at 94% at Jamestown, we'd be at 83% at Warhill versus 109 and 94. And so it takes, takes our overall utilization from you know, the, the mid-90s down to the high 80s. Um, I think we may have to discuss, based on our conversation today, how we move forward with, with presenting this publicly based on that CIP direction. So moving to our, our first option here, um, what these were is, is we kind of attempted to just um, a, a minimalistic approach to reduce enrollment at Jamestown and increase enrollment at Lafayette and not hurt the socioeconomic balance. And so this is a very simple move. It takes this area right here from Jamestown to Lafayette. And that is uh, Green Springs West and Plantation. Yes, together. And so what this does is it takes our utilization at Jamestown from 111 down to 96. Lafayette goes up to 99. Uh, Warhill stays the same. Our socioeconomics at Jamestown go from 20 to 23%. Lafayette from 39 to 36. Warhill stays the same. And so it's a minimalistic move to, to balance the enrollment uh, given no additions. And, and we kind of block out this table down here because this is a scenario that we don't need additions to do. We can do it just based on our current capacity. 
And so this would only impact 100 and 113 students, and it, it, it does accomplish that goal of balancing that utilization. And it, it doesn't do a lot uh, for the, the socioeconomics, but as we went through this, we really learned that the, um, you have to move a, 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 almost an exponential amount of kids to really move that socioeconomic balance needle. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's difficult sometimes. So here's our comparison side by side. Um, again, that minimal change. Okay, so here's our option two. Uh, th again, this is a very similar, uh, similar move here, but instead of Green Springs uh, West and Plantation, it's Powhatan Secondary moving from um, Jamestown to Lafayette. And it's not split, it's all of them. And so uh, similar, similar impacts here. Uh, Jamestown from 111 down to 95. Lafayette, 86 to 100%. Warhill stays at 94. Pretty similar impact with the socioeconomics. And this impacts 131 students. Here's our side-by-side -side map. So this is our, our, our last option that we kind of have of that minimal, that minimal approach. So what this one does is this is a King something. King's Mills. King's Mills would move from Jamestown to Lafayette. And so 111 to 99, Lafayette 86 to 96. <clears throat> Again, uh, all three of these options are going to be pretty pretty comparable as far as their, their socioeconomic balance, number of students moved, and their utilization. Uh, this is an impact of 94 students, so this doesn't do as much as the other one did, but it's a pretty good balance here. So looking at them side by side. <coughs> Okay, so now what we're getting into with option four is this is a more, um, a more in-depth scenario. This does require the utilizations at, uh, at Jamestown and Warhill in order to work. Uh, it, it doesn't really do anything. It doesn't work without the, without the um, additions. So with the additions, we'd be uh, 95 to 90% at Jamestown. Lafayette <coughs> would, would go up slightly. Warhill. Uh, 80 to 85 percent, but we're able to impact the socioeconomics much better. But you know, by by moving more areas, and so Jamestown, instead of being at 23 percent in the scenarios one, two, and three, we're up to 27 percent, and Lafayette goes from 39 down to 33 percent, and Warhill stays about the same. Uh, this option is also contiguous. I'm going to go to the next slide, and then I'll come back to this one. And so right now we have, we have these detached areas up here, uh, Scott's Pond, and there's some, uh, there's some, I think some apartment communities right here, right around uh, Lafayette. Um, what this does is this, this fixes all of that, uh, those disconnected areas. And so every single boundary <coughs> is going to be contiguous, um, with the exception of this, you know, this one area that would move from from uh, Lafayette to War Hill, but I think that you know, given the road network and, and the you know the, the close proximity, I think you could argue that it is contiguous. So looking at this, our, our socioeconomic spread is 27 to 33. Uh, we don't have any neighborhood splits. Um, we've just got we've got more movement because we're moving more area to to better balance that socioeconomic. <coughs> okay, so that's scenario four. So here's scenario five, um, and what this, what this option was is this was an attempt to basically get it perfect. And so if you look at this one, we're, we're at 30% at each high school. Uh, and our, our utilization is right around 96 or 97% at each high school. We don't need additions with this, with this scenario. And uh, there's a lot of areas that are moving. Um, we've got both Powhatan Secondary and uh, Green Springs and, plant and Plantation moving from Jamestown to uh, Lafayette. We've got more schools, we've got more students that aren't going to their closest neighborhood school. We're up to 5%. We've got kids that are, you know, in pretty close proximity to Jamestown coming up to Lafayette. 
So looking at this side by side, here's our current boundaries. Uh, this scenario is also contiguous. And uh, we, did, we did split up this area over here where, where part of it, goes to, or part of it uh, goes to Jamestown and part of it does stay at Lafayette. And we did try to use major roads in this scenario as well. And so again, this is that, this is that scenario where we try to balance everything perfectly. So that's it for the for the, the high school options. Uh, we on the survey we do have an option six, which is existing boundaries, no change. <coughs> so we do have that we do have that ability on the on the survey. I didn't feel the need to kind of go through it because it's our first slide that we have here. Uh, as far as next steps go, uh, Thursday we're at Warhill Middle School maps from five to six thirty, high school maps from seven to eight thirty. Um, on Tuesday next week, Lafayette, high school maps 5 to 6.30, middle school maps 7 to 8.30. Uh, and again, our online survey will remain active through December 12th. Any, any questions on the data or the presentation? Chair. Uh, Ms. Omi, yeah. Not a question, just I guess back to um, the chair's point. It will be very useful to have, particularly on the high school maps, the longevity mm -hmm. for each of the options. Like okay. really really clear and spelled out for the community and other folks to see. Okay. How long does this get us? Each one of the options. I think it's, I mean, it's, it's going to be a little challenging because of our additions and not having additions. Um, I, I don't think there's going to be that much difference in them. They're pretty similar from a balance of utilization standpoint, but we'll look into it and see if we can have that comparison like we want to do for the middle schools. And, and also, um, I'm assuming that there's a connection between proximity and ease of transportation. Yes. So that's that so is an accurate assumption. When we when we developed these options internally, we had transportation representation there as we were developing these. Okay. And so Mr. Snipes is nodding. I trust. <laughs> okay. So, um, any other questions about what was presented to us before we move on to the next discussion? So unlike, so what's different about high school uh, and is that we don't have to do this. And so um, because the, um, the discussion about whether or not to rezone high school uh, or adjust uh, attendance zones at the high school level has not been unanimous, that this is a good time to kind of uh, check in and, and see what everyone's uh, position is in terms of moving forward to the, to the next step. And, and, and following the path of, of the middle schools and, and discussing them in December, these maps in December and then in January with the potential of taking action in, in uh, February. So um, with that, uh, I guess just would like input in kind of what your thoughts are about moving forward. So Mrs. Young, would you like to just? Uh, I'm, I'm for not moving forward with next steps and uh, part, of, part of my reasoning is, is I, I think the impact on the number of students, um, I don't think it warrants it. And secondly, um, I'm, I'm still in favor of creating equity among programs at the different high schools and because I think that solves a lot of the, the inequities uh, among the high schools. So I am not in favor of uh, pursuing high school changes. So if so, if we're not going to, I'm just I'm going to ask everybody these questions. But if we're not going to add space, or maybe um, we don't know when, because we have to go through a planning process with the right. counties, and we don't, I'm not. If you could maybe unpack that your statement about equity across programs, and just kind of what you think about if there's a need to redistrict and when, that would be helpful. I think to understand. Um, and I, I okay. Um, well, first of all, I would like to see pathways at all the schools. I'd like to see access to early uh, college at all the schools uh, for our, our um, you know, students that would like to go to Thomas Nelson and get credits there. Um, and I understand this, but when I've talked to, to students from the schools, they don't seem to think that Jamestown is that crowded. Uh, they seem to think it's okay, and so. I'm also opposed to it because I think um, if students don't think they're that crowded, then, um, then I think maybe we should be listening to them. 
uh, and, and being concerned about what they're saying about their school because we're, we're looking at students leaving that school that have friendships there that are already um, connected as far as, as teams are connected, you know, as sports, uh, their mascot. Um, I'm, I'm just not for moving that. And then we would also get into the um, other thing, which has not been mentioned here, is then we're going to have to start talking about, about grandfathering students and how many students is that going to impact if we're going to have students decide, if we decide to choose one of these options, how many students are going to need to be grandfathered because then you're looking at students that are going to their senior year and we're certainly, uh, I wouldn't think that we would be considering moving them. So that's also another issue here. So I'm not sure that I think it's, uh, I don't think it's the right time to move it. So, so if I understand you correctly, you're not in favor of moving forward for the foreseeable future. Just keep things as they are for the foreseeable future. For the foreseeable future. Okay. Dr. Heron, could you speak to pathways and, and early college for just a second, please? Just yes, early college is available at, at all three high schools. It started at War Hill, but it's now been expanded right. to I understood that. both others. With, with limitations in numbers, Dr. Carroll can certainly give some information with regard to pathways. We have something at all three high schools, and we're in the process of working out what that looks like next year. Dr. Carroll, do you want to add anything to that, or that's pretty much it? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're in the process of literally taking all three and figuring out what the next year looks like in all three schools. So they all do have options right now, and I know Dr. Carroll's even exploring other things like Project Lead the Way and to see what's possible there to have something like that in all three schools as well. And I'm, I'm excited about that. I think that's going to be wonderful for our students. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Zombi, what do you think about moving forward at the high school? I think we need to move forward. I would like to have feedback from the community on, on each of these options. Um, for me, this is closely related to the CIP, and so without knowing what our funding partners are prepared <coughs> to fund, I don't know how we cannot um, discuss redistricting. I think we have to mitigate the capacity issues at Jamestown. There's certainly an opportunity through redistricting to, to bring equity and, and parity um, with programs with socioeconomic status. Um, we, we, there are some things that we can do that are programmatic that are not, not tied to redistricting, but we can't get past the fact that Jamestown is over capacity. Even if students don't think that it is, the, the data is very clear that it, that it is. And so I think it's our responsibility as a school board attendance zones that are balanced um, and, and are, and are forward-thinking. And so I, I see components here that I like. I, I like that we have expansions, personally. So I, I want to hear from the community, which, looking at these options, um, what options do they think are most viable? I think our funding partners need to weigh in on, on these options and see that, we are, that the struggle is real, but we can't do nothing. What do you think? About going forward with the high school? Yes, sir. I'm, uh, as I said before, I believe I was the only one at the last board meeting. Why would, do you not want to move forward? Um, I, as, as it's been pointed out by a number of people on the board, is there are many things up in the air right now, and I would just as soon um, settle the middle school redistricting and depending on what happens this next year, turning to the redistrict and the high school. So kind of put these on a shelf and then maybe revisit it yeah. a year from now? Yeah. Um, Mr. Kelly, you are a leader on, in, in this discussion. You were the first out at the gate. Why don't you tell us? I think it was May I was the first out. Yes, here. sir. Um, our funding partner said to consider redistricting. They didn't say to do it. Um, and they were right to ask us to consider it because it would seem that, you know, if you, if you move, a couple, move some students around that you can get there. Uh, what, the, what these maps seem to show us is that, um, that we can't get there without adding additional capacity. Um, you know, redistricting doesn't get us either capacity or gets us um, socioeconomic balance. 
So I think, I think we need to have this as part of the strategic discussion at high school. If we want to send these maps out um, to get public comment, that was fine, but it should have the asterisk that we are not going to do it next year, that we are sending this maps, these maps out to kind of get a thought while we go through um, our strategic planning process, maybe put a task force together, community members, to kind of figure out what we want to do um, with high school. Um, I think it tells us that we need additional inventory, whether that is expansions of the high schools or whether that is down the road, a new high school with maybe trailers between here to there. But I think that has to be part of our um, strategic discussion that we have. Um, you know, if we, if we let's, say, let's say now that we do go forward with the expansions, um, Jamestown's our over capacity school. I would say that we would do our, our expansions at Jamestown first. And then maybe after we do that expansion, then we look at redistricting while we have that inventory at our highest school as we do the expansions at Lafayette and Warhill. I wouldn't think that we would have to wait until the end of all the expansions to do them if we're going to do it that way. Um, but uh, I just don't see where um, redistricting for the next school year uh, gets us anywhere um, for longevity. And then my concern would be that we redistrict next year, we do the expansion, then we're like, you know, but we should do, we should do something a little bit different. We should have a little bit different redistricting area, and so then have to go through another redistricting process after we get through our expansions. So I think it's incumbent upon us to have a strategic plan. Um, I don't think we have a strategic plan right now. I think we have a reactionary plan, and um, I think we just need to hold off until we get that strategic plan. Um, I would like to see us take the good options, like take the options and get feedback from the community on the options. That's what I would like. I think that um, it, along with the strategic feedback that we need about are we okay with trailers? Are we okay with spending, you know, twenty-five million dollars for expansion? And like, what, what are our funding partners okay with and comfortable with? And it's nice to have these options to be able to, um, I guess, look at the different scenarios as we're going forward. Uh, I, I think it's important to get people's feedback on them now. Um, so for me, that's why I think we can move forward without actually deciding to do anything with it. I think we can move forward with getting feedback from the community on the different options. Um, I think we're in a tricky position when we're so over capacity at Jamestown um, to not do anything. To just keep putting everything off for a year, I think it's not fair to our, our kids. And I do want to say that if I were a high school student and didn't want to move from my high school, I would very clearly say it's not too crowded for me. So that, to me, is not a... a, a viable, um, that's not the data I'm looking at. That's not the data that I'm... I'm considering really valid. So that's my opinion. Currently, given the presented information, I don't believe we should move forward with it. Um, I'm not opposed to getting feedback from the community on the maps. Um, they're important to have. I think there are too many unknowns, as many of the other board members have said, um, to decide that for next year. Uh, we have kind of, not for the foreseeable future, or put them on a shelf for a year from now. Weigh in on um, that. I'd like to put it on the shelf for a year. Right, so the majority of the board is not in favor of moving forward. Um, that said, as part of this process, we have been inclusive of items uh, in, in moving forward um, in, out of deference to the minority. And, um, and so with that in mind, I am going to, as the chair's prerogative, go ahead and keep this on the agenda for the December meeting um, at a minimum. And I am going to ask that the feedback from the public be shared with the board. And I'm also um, 
going to ask Dr. Heron if she can take a look at these maps and perhaps think about um, for the first three options, which move the fewest number of students, if there is an opportunity for a phase-in approach. And perhaps you can come back and, um, and report to us on that at the December meeting. Is that something that you would be willing? We, we can look at that for sure. So what you're planning is maybe starting with ninth grade and moving through if we were to move forward at all. Well, if you could look and talk to you know, transportation and talk to um, you know, consultants and see. I think um, the research that you all have done has been pretty exhaustive, so thank you for that. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not common to redistrict when space is not being added, when a capacity is not being added or taken away. That said, the, ter the ter terminology spot redistricting is not unheard of. It does, it does happen when capacity at schools becomes imbalanced. And so, so that, is the, that is the reason for that question to you, Dr. Heron, and, and really exploring that a little bit. I think we owe it to the public to, and to the taxpayers to do that, particularly because of the CIP conversation we had where we moved um, down a little. Because if we build a new high school, fourth high school, or if we add capacity now, we've, we've delayed that even further. So you're talking, you know, at least four years, probably five, before anything's on, any additional space is online, which means if we take action now, there is no one child's high school career would be impacted twice. Um, so I think that's, uh, in, in my thinking, um, you know, and, and again, my conversations with our, the leadership um, of our funders, I think <clears throat> it is important for us to move forward, at least put it on the December agenda with that opportunity to get the feedback from staff and from the public. Um, I think that these maps at the high school level demonstrate that we can uh, achieve some of our, um, some of our goals and um, in terms of capacity and economic balance. So, um, so I think that regardless of what we end up doing with inventory, I, I, think, we're, I think we're compelled to at least explore further um, adjusting uh, on the ground with what we have now, um, knowing that no, no additional inventory, no additional capacity is going to be coming to us anytime soon. Um, so that, uh, does anyone have any comments or questions about that? Uh, yeah, so, so, um, so we are going forward with the presumption that we may actually redistrict high schools next spring, even though the majority thinks that that's not the, what we shouldn't do. Well, I mean, as I said, we have deferred to the minority on this process before, and so because it's a split board, I think that's the best thing to do. And as the chair, I'm going to take that prerogative. Okay, I didn't worry, it was your prerogative to do that. Um, but um, I think that if we were to say that we were going to consider them and take it off for next year, that you might get better conversations than if you say that it's still on the, on the table for next year. I think, I think that you were setting up a, a I mean, we have, let's, let's make sure that we understand that our actions have consequences. And we have kids who are up right now wondering where they're going to school next year, and they're watching school board meetings instead of studying calculus. And so if we were to take this off, they could go back to studying calculus and realize that they weren't going to have to worry about this until next year. And I just don't think that we're being fair to our community to, to go that way. But uh, I guess. So, so, so we're going to have, so we're, we're going to. I mean, we can still go out for the public comment, but take it off the off the map for next year. Zombie, do you have anything to say to that? Yeah, the only thing. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm I'm eager to hear um, feedback from the community, which includes our funding partners, and. Um, there's an opportunity not only to address capacity issues through this redistricting, but an opportunity to, to look at um, equity and parity. So, and that for me is important. There is distinctly an imbalance um, at the high school level. Uh, there, is, there is not parity with economic integration. And so while the, not all these options move the needle very far, um, some do more than others. And so I would like to hear from the community and from funding partners, is it, is it important to, um, to try to fix that now? And at the same time, mitigate capacity issues. 
I'd like to hear what the community has to say. Dr. Beers? Yeah, the only thing I was going to add is we've gotten an awful lot of feedback yes. from parents already, school redistricting. They had touched on a number of the criteria that we've actually been looking at. So I, um, I hope we don't ignore um, that feedback that we've had. So we, we've already had some of that feedback already. So I'm willing to wait for more feedback, but I don't want to ignore what we've already received parents, family, community, community members. Um, we've, we've also heard from a whole lot of um, community members about the, the need for um, equity in our schools. I mean, a, a lot um, of broad-based community support for that. So I, I think we have, on one hand, um, we're receiving feedback from neighborhoods who rightfully, it's just like a rightful, like a, a gut, yes, I don't want my kid to move to another high school next year. And then on the other hand, we have kind of a, a, another whole level of feedback that we're getting from the community saying that we have an inequitable situation in our school system. So I, I am... Yeah, I, 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 didn't, I hope I didn't leave the impression that I was dividing up the feedback. I was just, what I had said was, we've received a lot of feedback. And, and, um, and, and the feedback has dealt with a number of our criteria, just, just as you said. The equity issue, um, we have had um, a lot of feedback on that. So, yeah, no, I, I, I meant all of the, all the feedback, and that includes that. But I guess to your point, Dr. Beers, we haven't had feedback about these maps and about opportunities to correct and bring balance with equity. So there's, there's some opportunity here for folks to look at different ways that our schools can look and operate. So that this is, people haven't had an opportunity to respond to this. And I, yeah, and I would say that we're redistricting middle school no matter what. If we're going to redistrict high school, I don't see the point in um, delaying that a year when we know it's going to stick for at least four years and therefore not interrupt any student's high school career because I think that's that's a pretty important thing and if there's an opportunity to look at these maps which are new to all of us in, in, including the staff um, and figure out a way to phase it in on one or a couple of the map options so that to your point Mr. Kelly um, students are not don't have to move high schools but can stay where they are, I think it's too soon to say no to that. And so I think I see in these maps a possibility for staff to come back to us and see if that's possible. You know, miss, you know the, 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 the consultants talked about that phase in approach in their original presentation to us. Staff can explore that. We can see if we can redistrict in one year. Um, middle school and high school, and if we can figure that out, we could move the needle a little on socioeconomic status, not a lot, but a little, and we could ease capacity and buy a little time for our funders. All the schools will be fuller than we want them to be, or that best than best practice, but they're not, no one would, no one school would be over capacity. So I think it's just too early, so I would like as chair to put it on the next meeting and see if there's an opportunity and if it doesn't work out, if the numbers don't work, if the math doesn't work out, then, you know, then I think we have more information. But I still think, and, and having read the James City County CIP me the budget message last year, I think the county administrator was pretty clear that there's not, there's not any money for many the, years. The county administrator also was always, uh, and I'm sorry that, that he's left us, but he always... Uh, from the day he got here, he was always focusing on long-term strategic planning so that there was plenty of time to work out the kinks to, 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 to deal with some of the things that we have to do in the future. Not, I'm not going to speak for Brian, but he, he can speak for himself, but he was not excited about uh, sudden shifts and changes. So 
So I, I don't, you know, some of the things that are in the CIP now weren't there two years ago. And I think that's part of this whole, and I, and I think Mr. Uh, Mr. Kelly is absolutely right, is that um, we do need, um, and, and I think there's, there's a reason for why it's been so difficult, or is difficult, to develop a long-range plan. Um, we've had five superintendents in 10 years. That's really hard to, 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 to create, to sustain um, long-term, long uh, long-range planning. So um, I've, uh, I echo that uh, the need for doing that. So, uh, but that. Ms. Nomby, um, to your point, Dr. Beers, I, I don't think any of us um, believe that we should not be long range in our thinking. However, we have to deal with students that we have in our buildings today and tomorrow and next year and two years down the road. And from what I've heard, at least from from my counterpart on the Board of Supervisors, there, there's not going to be a school in the next four or five years. So I, I think that is a reality. Maybe when they see these maps, they'll come up with something else. Um, but we, it, we have capacity issues today. I, I understand We, we have that. to address those today. But I also understand that we have our own responsibility in making decisions about what we think is important for our, our students. And, um, and the long-range plan is, I know the elementary school, a new elementary school, is somewhere on the book somewhere coming down the line that's in that long plan. Yeah, so how, so, and you say, well, they're not going to, they're not, they're not going to um, provide the funding for to build a new school. We're going to need an elementary school probably before we need a high school. So I, I don't, um, I don't accept that logic. Today. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I do appreciate the fact that that um, we, as the minority, originally has been attended to. I do appreciate that. I'm very concerned about sending a message out to the community that is going to leave people up in the air. I mean, that's basically what we're saying we're going to do. We're going to leave them up in the air until the spring. I, I don't appreciate that, and I think that's a wrong message to send to the community. Four people on this board have, don't want to move forward, and um, and I think that should be respected. Um, I, I understand everything that everybody has said. I, I, I don't want to leave the community up in the air. I don't want to leave students up in the air uh, about where they're going to be next year. So I'm concerned about where we're at at the moment. Don't be. Um, to that point, Mrs. Young, so um, all of the families whose children will be impacted by the middle schools will be up in the air until the spring. And we're okay with that. Because we have to make a decision about the middle school maps, and we're not going to make that decision until February. They don't know. Like, so right now, my middle schooler is staying up late wondering where he's going to go to school. So that's okay at the middle school level, but not at the high school level? We don't have a new we don't have a new high school coming on board, and I capacity issues. Well, and I understand the capacity issues. I've seen the numbers. <coughs> I I'm, was looking at our nice spreadsheet that we had earlier. I am not for leaving families up in the air. I, I every parent I've spoken to, and I have several of them here. I have told them all bets are off for middle school. We know that all bets are off for middle school. High school. No, I'm talking about middle school. All middle schoolers are there. There's going to be redistricting in the middle school, no matter what. Okay. We all know that. Middle schoolers know that. I am not for leaving high schoolers up in the air or their parents. So even if we were able to choose one of the first three maps to ease capacity that we know we don't have at Jamestown and we do have at Lafayette, and we were able to allow students to matriculate freshmen starting so no student had to leave their current high school, you four would not support that? No. Ease capacity for the next four years. 
Four years. We would not support that. I think you're going to have to produce uh, numbers to, to show how many freshmen are going to be impacted, how many sophomores are going to be impacted, how many juniors. I am not for doing that. So if no, no sophomore, juniors, or seniors had to move from their current high school. Uh, uh, Excuse me, uh, sir. Uh, there's uh, no. Thank you, parliamentarian. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> As parliamentarian, the only people who get to talk are the people up here. So I just want to make sure that the, the four people, you know, Mrs. Young, Dr. Beers, Mr. Kelly, if, if we have the opportunity to ease capacity for four to five years based on slower growth projections, based on the first three maps, easing that in so that no student has to leave where they currently are, and then allowing us the time to do um, the strategic planning that you're all talking about, plus do this all in one year and not have to revisit this a year. Are you saying you would not do that? I would not do that, no. I mean, that, is not, that is not showing that you have a strategic plan. That is showing that you are taking knee-jerk reaction. And I also like just had to understand, how, have, how has this board so far deferred to the minority? Oh, with the criteria? Um, the, the no, with, with the whole discussion about whether we should go forward with the high school redistrict or not. No, no, the criteria to, included, we had four votes to not include neighborhoods, and because it was a close vote, we included it to, to defer to the minority, which was the right thing to do. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> Mrs. Young, I, I, did, you, did you understand? I understand what you're saying, but I would like to know how many students are affected. Okay, so if we provide that information for the December meeting. That doesn't mean I'll change my mind, but I would like to see not. that information. Yeah. Yes, that would, that would, I would appreciate the information. And then you're talking about the three maps, because you're going to have to have information about freshmen, in, incoming freshmen at each of the high schools, right? At, at least, like for example, the uh, map number one, where you're talking about Green Springs West and Plantation, then you're going to have to demonstrate how many freshmen that would affect, that would be moved from Jamestown to Lafayette. And then same with map two, then you're going to have to show how many students from uh, Palatine Secondary would be affected that would be moved from, James, that would be potential students at Jamestown that would be moved to Lafayette. And the same with, with map three with the Kings Mill people. So, oh, I just think it's a mess. I, I don't want to move forward, really, I don't. But I would be interested in seeing the information and that, that's putting extra work on our staff. Um, given the current information and the current input, I'm still against it, but I'm open to receiving more information, more dialogue from the community, hearing what they have to say. Dr. Beers? I think I've pretty much said what I was going to say. Anything else on this item? So just, so I understand the people on the board who are opposed to to looking at options for relieving um, the overcrowded. It, the other option is that we're going to just maintain overcrowded schools for the indeterminate future. One overcrowded school. One overcrowded school for the indeterminate future, at least three or four years, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking my, at that's that. That's my understanding. The, yeah. So four years of overcrowded at one school. Okay. I just and, and then just to add to that, too, there would be a missed, a missed opportunity to, to bring equity and parity and, and, and balance among our schools. A missed opportunity. So we'll um, ask staff to take a look at the first three maps 
and whether there's an option to phase those in, and what kind of um, capacity relief will we realize at Jamestown, and then and then filling Lafayette, and how many? But we're also, Madam Chair, we're also looking at transportation. I <laughs> mean, and the transportation impact of that. I think you have some of the information already because we already know how the capacity would be impacted at Lafayette should we make minimal changes. And we also know how the socioeconomic status will be impacted if we make any of the three minimal changes that were presented tonight. What we really don't know, and I'm not even sure where to start, Mr. Snipes, we can, we can ask questions and see what transportation information we can find. I mean, it's going to be a relatively proportional number right. between the three. It's just, you know, maybe 25% of 131, 25% <coughs> of 94, and 25% of 203, and that could be the difference. So maybe we can flesh that out a little bit and provide those options to the board. And, and as, you know, if that information is provided to you all, Um, <clears throat> I would also, uh, I've already started counting up the number of empty classrooms, um, all three of the high schools. I'd like to see how that gets built into this whole utilization capacity. I know we can't do that. Can't do that now because that, that, that involves um, some serious um, scheduling. But it, there are there are a lot of classrooms that are empty during the day, and um, that is another way of dealing with um, folks that are at capacity. So I'm not saying do that now. You know, I'm not saying do it now, but I, I think that is useful information. Um, the only thoughts is that, that at Jamestown right now there are, uh, because we are over capacity and a lot of the rooms are being utilized, uh, there are rooms to use at Warhill, but we see growth coming there quicker. Growth is not coming at Lafayette and there, is some, there are some rooms for use there. And so there is the potential to, to use that through a redistricting process or trying to do something programmatically. <laughs> Dr. Beers, to your point, so there, is, there, are, there are rooms that are available to be used at Lafayette, so what do you propose we do with those rooms? To, to what? Not just Lafayette, there are the other high schools. There's none at Jamestown, so there's some at Warhill and there's some at Lafayette, right. so go in those rooms and how would they get there? Well, I don't, that, that, you know, that's a good question. I just would like to know how many could be accommodated in those classes, in those, you know, those empty classrooms. But would that suggest redistricting? Just a number I'd like to know. It's also complicated by what courses you're offering and how you're going to offer them. It's not enough just to have an empty space, but what do you put in that space and how does that fit into the, pro, into the academic programming? It's a much more complicated question than just to say we have we have an empty classroom. Let's put thirty kids in it. Dr. Heron, do you have any questions about information? Yeah, Madam Chair, from what I understand, just for clarity, moving forward, obviously we're not going to bring to the the public for feedback any of the options that include additions because we're not we're not going there right now. We don't know what the potential is. And so are we bringing all the other four options to the public, three minimal movement options and the one that moves seven or 800 students, or are we asking for feedback across the board what, what, just for make sure we give the right maps out there? So um, in terms of, in your opinion, your collective opinion, Is 
the idea of phasing in attendance zones in the other maps logistically feasible. I think we talked about that early on as complicated and perhaps cost prohibitive um, given our current transportation situation. So in your... It's going to be difficult. Any phase-in approach is going to impact transportation greatly. I don't... It, nothing is impossible. We, we would have to look at it. Um, I really don't know of the minimal movement maps or moving everyone around will impact transportation any differently. And without having rest is finalized and knowing exactly who's going where, it's, it's difficult to plan routes to even see what we'd need to do. It's a very, it's hard to come up with answers without a very detailed and comprehensive approach to it. So I'd be a little bit concerned about bringing information that I couldn't stand over at this moment in time. But we certainly can. So what's your recommend? I mean, do you have any? Take a look at it. Thoughts about, I mean, your question specifically about which maps to, sh to, sh to share with the public. The only one I was mentioning was the one with additions that we take off. Okay. Because we're not planning additions. We don't know what we're doing in that yet with long range planning. So that was, there, there are three minimal options and one <coughs> more movement at the high school, which still leaves four options to go to the public. But I don't think we should include the option that is viable. All right, option four. four, which is not viable without the actual additions. So is everybody okay if option four is removed? No, some of you want all of them removed. Um, I just, you know, for the record, I just want to say that I think it's um, in incompatible to move the request for additions back and, and say you're going to strategic plan and then not redistrict. I think those are two incompatible thoughts. I think you could say, let's do the additions and let's ask and see if we get it and then hold off on redistricting to see what that says. But I think if this board decides for very good reason to push it back and, and work with our funders to figure out what it is this community wants to do with regard to high school space, given that we know that pushes it back the idea of just allowing a school to be overcrowded, knowing we have capacity at another school, just very difficult. Or I don't, I don't understand that. If I can ask for, for clarity again, do we want to take forward the option at all that moves a large number of students at this point? Is that something you still want? input on just to make sure that that's where we're going. I do. Okay. That's equity and parity and, and balance. And quite frankly, I like option four. Um, you know, option recognizing if we to expand, you know, this this gets us ten years. And util I mean utilization is is fairly balanced. Uh, Option five, just for those of you with kind of like a historical, um, when we were building War Hill, option five was the was one of the maps. It was option C back in the day, and I, I always think it's kind of interesting that a lot of times when we're trying to achieve balance, a lot of times Sorry. you'll. You'll have really weird looking maps <laughs> in order to achieve balance. And this option five, I'm just making an observation, is a very contiguous uh, map that achieves per perfect balance. So That's it's just map. interesting to me that we have um, engineered in our current high school zones an extremely um, inequitable situation and it is engineered that way when you look at what could just naturally be a contiguous option that actually balances all the schools. Jim, 
Jim Beers and I agree. Needs <laughs> <laughs> to be there. So. All right. So we'll get more information um, for the December board meeting. Meeting. See. Yes. So which maps are going to the public? I think. I think it's other than the one that we just took off the table because we're not asking for additions at this point. It's gone. So that one, that one that was required additions makes no sense. But everything else, I think, is out there. And uh, again, I want to reiterate, um, please, for people who are listening, comment online. Go to the meetings if your schedules allow. Are all of our numbers are published? Write us. I've gotten regular old U.S. mail. That's great. Um, please, please be in touch. Um, all right. If there's nothing else to say about 10.04, that mo moves us to 11.01. Board member comments and request, Mrs. Young. Well, first of all, I want to thank the school division for the red sheet. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I, I requested that, and um, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. That was a lot of work, and, and I appreciate it, because I think that uh, gives us a better picture of where we are with uh, capacity issues. Uh, I want to apologize for the FaceTime call from my son, who keeps forgetting that I'm on the school board on Tuesday nights. Um, I want to thank Dr. Moore for the um, equity literacy presentation. Uh, literacy, to me, is the number one thing that all kids need. So I'm, that's huge on my agenda. Um, thank Cooperative Strategies for standing there all that time. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I do want to encourage the public to, um, to go online and give feedback. Please attend the the two opportunities to go to the schools and look at the maps. Uh, and please utilize the feature that's going to be online where you can put in your address and see where your student uh, would end up for next year. Um, but all in all, I want to thank the school division for their hard work. I want to thank the board. Um, we, we may have differences of opinion, but I think in the end it will all come together OK. And if not, we'll still like each other. So. Anyway, I want to thank um, Mr. Harris um, for being a spider. I'm, I'm still concerned about what kind of spider that's going to be. Please don't make it a black widow. Um, but um, I'm excited about the colors, and, and it sounds to me like <coughs> your presentation tonight on James Larry that you're going to be there next year, Principal, Ms. Mr. Principal Harris. So anyway, thank you very much. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Young Ms. Ombi. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I um, wanted to acknowledge that I think right. all, most, if not all of our um, PTAs and PTSAs have just wrapped up their Reflections Art Contest. Um, and so students have moved on to the district level and then eventually go on to the state level. And wanted to thank all of our PTAs and PTSAs for their hard work in coordinating this um, opportunity for students to showcase their art. Um, would like to echo what Mrs. Young just said and encourage citizens to attend um, the, the redistricting forums on the 30th and on the 5th. And just wanted to share with the community as we work through the CIP process, I wanted to point out that things like roofs and chillers and HVAC systems, um, sewer lines are not particularly exciting, <laughs> but they are necessary. And I'm very grateful uh, to our funding partners um, and then by extension the community um, that they fund the maintenance of our buildings. Um, as I travel to neighboring schools for sporting events, it's evident that not all communities do such a great job. So when I see missing ceiling tiles and exposed electrical wiring and rain is coming into the gym where students are playing um, a sport, I'm very grateful to be part of this community. So I believe that our board takes its fiduciary responsibility very seriously. We are advocates for our schools and for our students and for this division, but we are also all taxpayers. And um, we weigh the cost and the longevity of all of our capital projects. Um, in order for this division to remain premier, we'll need to continue to expand and or build schools to meet the projected growth. So finding that balance between cost and timing and need is delicate and requires collaboration and community support. Did have an opportunity to tour uh, Claire Bird Baker yesterday with the chair and um, 
City Councilwoman Barbara Ramsey, um, and I'm always struck and astonished to learn how demographics are changing drastically in our community. And so CBB um, has a significantly higher number of, of students, um, ELL students, students with disabilities, um, and economically challenged um, students. And, and with all of those challenges, I just applaud all of the staff, teachers, and administrators at CBB for striving to ensure that each and every student achieves academic success. So I um, wanted to remind Williamsburg that our demographics are changing. Um, and students are coming to our, our, our schools um, with a lot of need, and that requires resources to meet that need. Dr. Beers? Uh, yeah, I've, I'll keep this. Uh, I've, I uh, once again uh, applaud those, the winners of all of those things, uh, especially Model UN, but the Robotic Award, Art Prizes, the presentation by Norge um, tonight, uh, it's fabulous, and Dr. Moore. Um, as, uh, Ms. DiPaolo knows I'm um, always excited to hear about what you're doing see in Williamsburg. Um, it's, it's always been in the forefront of, of a lot of uh, literacy initiatives over the years. So, uh, I look forward to coming out there and seeing some of that at, at work. Um, I, the other thing is, um, I, um, I, I, I really, it, it's important to think all staff. Um, that's why I don't <coughs> speak too much longer, because um, but you put in so many hours, and I want to shut up so you can. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Mr. Kelly? I hope everyone had a happy and safe Thanksgiving and uh, coming back to finish out the rest of the, at least the calendar year. Um, I won't poll my fellow board members to see who went to the one act plays at Lafayette after my prodding at the last meeting, but uh, if you missed out, it's your fault and uh, your miss. I would like to congratulate the Lafayette football team for winning the region. If we can find the video of Dr. Nunnally giving the team the trophy, it is classic TV. <laughs> She was, uh, her excitement and engagement with the team was really amazing to me and uh, best wishes in the team going out and winning one last trophy. And uh, this weekend, uh, Jamestown Theater is having their uh, Christmas Carol uh, play, which I look forward to attending this weekend, so. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Ms. Hummel? Um, I had the privilege of participating in a design thinking exercise with the um, high schools over at the School of Ed, and where uh, I, I got to see kind of a work in progress of how the school system is um, going to try to attack the challenge of the new profile of a student graduate with regard to career opportunities. And so I just wanted to thank uh, Dr. Heron and um, the rest of the staff for letting me participate in that. That was really a fun exercise. And then I wanted to say that I'm looking forward to Stonehouse's Blue Ribbon uh, event tomorrow morning. Um, I think that'll be great. And of course, all the rest of the wonderful things. I'm going to keep it short, too. So that's it. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. Mrs. Taylor? All right, so many of the board members have already turned in their board evaluations, but if you have not already done so, <laughs> please turn them in to Ms. Serza by this Thursday. Uh, it's the last day of November. I can't believe it. Okay, so, and I want to encourage the community to come out to attend our upcoming community dialogues on redistricting. We look forward to receiving your feedback. Um, I wanted to just, uh, again, congratulate Ms. McCory um, for her award tonight. And I saw her to apologize that I was not able to go to the one, one act play because I had a, another commitment. But she um, reminded me that um, for 11 years in a row, um, and she's been there 11 years. So she's a real force there at Lafayette with uh, those students. And um, it's amazing work out of them. So she's to be commended on many levels. And then also I wanted to thank my colleagues up here uh, for tonight's discussions that were very, very difficult. And, um, you know, it's we all have to make really tough decisions. And um, that's even more difficult to do as a group. So I appreciate all of your input and, um, and that we will get where we need to be. And 
good time. I also want to thank those of you who are able to attend the Virginia School Boards Association annual convention. Um, there were a lot of really good plenary speakers and some good um, breakout sessions, and we're all sharing that information with each other. It's, uh, it's exciting to hear about what else is going on around the state and what best practices are out there. Um, so thank you for that. And with that, I will move on to upcoming meetings. Uh, you've heard this a lot, but we've got two redistricting community dialogues, one on November 30th at 5 in the auditorium at Warhill, and then one on the 5th of December at 5 o'clock in the auditorium at Lafayette. I hope everyone can, can join in person or online or both. And then item 12.02, upcoming meetings. We have a closed session on December 12th uh, at room 309 in the Annex School Board Central Office, and then followed at 6.30 um, and room 300 um, at the Annex, there's a work session and action items, again, on the 12th. And then on the January 2nd at 6 p.m. in room 309 of the Annex um, at James Blair at 6 p.m., we'll have a closed session, followed by our um, organizational meeting at 6.30 on, this, on the 2nd of, of uh, January in the Annex. So those are our upcoming meetings, and with that, we are adjourned.